All right, you can go ahead. Okay, good evening. It is February 27th, 2023, and this is the first of three meetings tonight. This is the public forum regarding an appropriation outside the annual budget, specifically for the Centennial Water Treatment Facility. We will use the same link for the entire evening. On November 7th, 2022, an act was signed into law which extends the suspension of certain provisions of the open meeting law. This allows us to hold meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present at a meeting location while providing the public with adequate alternative access to the meeting. This meeting is accessible in real time via Zoom, by phone, and as a live broadcast on Amherst Media Channel 17 and through their live stream as well. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I am calling the February 27th, 2023 town council meeting to order at 531. Um, the, I'm calling the public forum to order at 531. I'll call upon each counselor, although they're not required to be here for this meeting, uh, except many of them are. So when I call your name, please respond uh, by uh, saying present and um, we'll continue on. When you're done, please make sure you mute your mic again. Shalini Balmil. Um, Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Jo Haneke. Anika Lopes. Present. Michelle Miller. Present. Dorothy Pam. Here. Pam Rooney. Here. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Here. And is Alicia here? And let's make sure we check the audience. She is not. Okay. Um, Andy, do you have a quorum of the finance committee present? And I think you do. I believe we do. And I need to um, ask Bob Hegner if he can hear and be heard. Yes, present. So we have a quorum of the finance committee present and the finance committee is called to order. Okay, thank you. There's no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Athena and me know. And uh, to make a comment or ask a question, use the raise hand function. If technical difficulties arise as a result of utilizing remote participation, we'll decide how to handle that situation. Uh, discussion may have to be suspended and the minutes will have to note that there was a discontinued effort. Uh, I see a hand up, Jennifer. Oh, I see Alicia in the audience. Thank you so much for letting us know that. We'll bring her in. Alicia, whoops. Alicia, can you hear us? Alicia Walker, can you hear us? Yes, I can, thank you. Liz. Thank you so much, Alicia. Um, so with that, we're going to begin with a brief presentation by Sean Mangano and Guilford Mooring. Sean is the finance director, Guilford is the superintendent of public works. And this regards financial order 23-09A. Sean? Thank you, Lynn. Um, so I'm sharing my screen to put the order up. Uh, can you see it? Yes. So this is order FY2309A. This is actually the third forum I think that we've had focused on Centennial because of rising costs. Uh, so most recently there was $18 million that was appropriated for the replacement of the Centennial water treatment plant. Uh, when we went out to get construction bids, the bids came in about four and a half to $5 million over the prior cost estimate. And so in order to complete the project, uh, we have to increase the amount appropriated. Um, so what we're proposing is rescinding the prior uh, borrowing authorization of 18 million and replacing it with a new one for 21.5 million, which will cover all the project costs. Um, so the, the higher costs are the bad news. The good news 
is that the state who is um, helping fund this project through the uh, Clean Water uh, Trust Fund um, has offered to increase the loan that they will give us. Um, they're willing to increase it by the eligible construction costs that came in uh, with the most recent bids. And so the benefits of that are that they offer 19.8% loan forgiveness. So with a higher loan, they're gonna forgive a larger amount. Uh, they also are offering a 1.5% interest rate on a higher portion of the project. So that will help offset the cost. And they also offer a 0% sort of construction financing. So while, while the project's going on, we don't have to um, go out and pay interest on the, the portion that they are financing. Uh, so those benefits have helped offset a significant portion of the higher cost. Um, and so there's a memo in the packet that has the, the order that's being rescinded, the new order, um, has some information on the construction bids, and there's also an estimate at the end of what we, we believe the additional impact uh, to the water, the water enterprise fund from, these, uh, from the additional appropriation here. And I Thank think, you. Guilford, anything you want to add? No, I think he covered it all. Okay, thank you. With that, I'm going to ask uh, if people who are in the audience would like to ask a question, make a public comment uh, with regard to this issue only. Uh, the floor is now open until we close this session at 545. Let me just note there's four attendees in the audience. I also want to welcome Amy Rusecki, who is the Assistant Superintendent for Department of Public Works. Again, if there's anybody in the audience who would like to make a public comment about the Centennial Facility, and this appropriation, please raise your hand. You're going to get tired of hearing me say that. I'm sorry. So I'll just mention that the Finance Committee has already voted to recommend this to the Town Council, sub subject to any discussion this evening. And uh, as Sean has explained, this is the third time this particular facility and borrowing has come up because of the ongoing increases in cost. So I'm looking for public comment with regard to the Centennial Water Facility. We will remain in this session until 544, we'll adjourn, and then we'll go immediately into the next public forum.
This is a public forum on Centennial Water Treatment Facility required by the Charter. At this point, there are four people in the audience on Zoom, but there are others that may be watching through Amherst Media on channel 17 or through their live stream. This is the public forum for the Centennial Water Treatment Facility. We'll have the public forum for this open for another minute or so, but don't go away because we'll be using this same link for the next public forum and for the council meeting. Athena, I'm told that Channel 17 is airing the February 21st meeting and is not live with this meeting. So I'll, I'll make sure you check on that. Thank I'm you. Checking. I'm checking. I see that they're not here. Right. Uh, we are going to um, be closing this public forum. Uh, I'm actually the council and the finance committee will be in the next public so forum. Uh, but we will not do roll call again unless we have an additional person who joins us. So for the purposes of this meeting, uh, this public forum is closed. The next public forum will open at 545. Okay. So this is actually the beginning of a new meeting. Good evening. It's um, February 27th, 2023. And this is the public forum on um, appropriations outside the annual budget, specifically as it relates to the recommendations of the Community Preservation Act Committee with regard to their allocations this year. This is the second meeting tonight and we'll be using the same link as we did before, as well as we will for the council meeting, which will begin. I do not see any additional counselors present. At this point, there are, I believe, 11 of us in the room. Uh, Andy, the finance committee is continuing to be in session. Yes, it is. Uh... And I assume that uh, we'll have a minute at the end of the second forum to see if there's any 
member of the Finance Committee who has a motion to reconsider in light of the forums. Uh, yes, thank you. All right, uh, with that, I'm going to go on and I'm going to call on uh, Sam McLeod, who is chair of the CPA Committee. And I wanna take the opportunity to thank Sam and all the members of the CPA Committee and the fat finance staff that have provided assistance and guidance to the committee as they've made their decisions this year. Sam, we're going uh, to show the purchase order and if you'll proceed. Uh, thank you, Lynn, and thank you all counselors for uh, all the hard work you do. And thank you for inviting me to briefly uh, comment. I've been asked to be very brief. And uh, so I'm just going to focus on these slide that's presented to the actual order. Uh, the committee had a lot of projects this year and delivered it very thoroughly. And what's going to be displayed is the slate of projects that is recommended by our committee for approval. Um, we were asked for more uh, funds than we had available. And this is the output of our process. Uh, essentially, you're looking at 11 projects here uh, in community housing, historic preservation, and open space. There was one other project that would be listed in a separate uh, authorization for bonding of the Fort River School. Uh, there is a full report that we submitted as a committee to the town council and town manager. I believe that's in the packet that can be read by those who may or may not have interest. Uh, separately, there was a presentation at the previous finance committee meeting on February 21st. Uh, in essence, the total appropriation recommended by the CPA committee for fiscal year 2024, starting next July is, 2,793,419, that's in bold near the bottom here. Uh, that's the actual expenditures, not just the new projects, but funds from previous uh, projects that have annual payments. Right below that, you'll see the total recommended from this year's project of 2,349,959. That's the sum of all the amounts above. Uh, and then the remaining balance is 443,460, which is debt service from previous projects. Again, uh, the full uh, delineation of the descriptions, the projects and the votes and totals are in the CPA report as submitted in this packet and in other town council meetings. Uh, I won't go into detail on each of the individual projects other than that the uh, committee was in uh, strongly in favor of most all of these. Uh, one of them was a six to two vote, which was the lowest total. So uh, that's it, uh, unless there are questions, and thank you. Let's show the other order because that is related to the fields at Fort River and is contingent upon the debt authorization uh, that is proposed to occur on May 2nd. Yep. Uh, my comment on this would be that uh, the original request came in at $3 million and then was uh, lowered to 2.2 million. Uh, the committee deliberated and the uh, recommended total given the current constraints is for a total sum of 700,000. Uh, two members, uh, did submit a minority report uh, not being in favor of this particular project. Uh, their reasons were based on the fact that it was a private citizens as opposed to town entities, uh, that there were potential other sources of funds, specifically the override vote, uh, and that they, those two members thought that the uh, fees, the, the annual expenditures might prevent future projects from going forward. I just wanted to reference that. But the committee voted six to two in favor of this authorization, uh, strongly in favor of it. So that's uh, a 10 year have, bond to my understanding. Thank you. And Sam, I believe you mentioned at our finance committee meeting that the schools in fact did voice their support for this project. Is that correct? Cool? Uh, yeah, the I watched the school committee meeting. There was a deliberation and a four to zero vote by the school committee in favor, strongly in favor of this and the Crocker Farm Playgrounds uh, project, which was withdrawn. Uh, in addition, the superintendent of schools, Mike Morris, 
expressed his broad support for this project. So both uh, um, the school committee and the superintendent publicly discussed and endorsed this uh, specific project. Okay, thank you. The floor is now open for public comment with regard to the Community Preservation Act recommendations this year. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand. It's required by charter that a public forum be held for anything outside the uh, annual appropriation. It's also required by the forum that we provide as much time for the public to speak as we have provided for introductions to the issue. While we're doing this, Shalini Balmilne has joined us. Shalini, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Sorry for the delay. No problem. Again, I'm looking for public comment with regard to the recommendations from the Community Preservation Act Committee. This is the public forum for the Community Preservation Act recommendations. And I'm looking for public comment. About four more minutes left of this public forum before we ask whether the Finance Committee has anybody who would wants to reconsider our recommendation. At this point, we are focused on the um, recommendations of the Community Preservation Act Committee for the 12 projects um, that they have recommended to the council.
I'm looking for any final comments from the audience. We have seven people in the audience uh, on Zoom and we hope others on Amherst Media. I'm going to note that uh, Councillor Mandy Jo Haneke has joined us. Mandy Jo, can you hear us? Yes. Thank you. It's now 5.58. We've had no comments with regard to this public forum, uh, which is specifically related to the CPA recommendation. Uh, Andy, I want to turn it over to you and ask you to proceed with the Finance Committee. Yes, I'll be presumably very quick, but maybe not. Depends upon what happens. But let me just make an explanation to the rest of the council and to the public. Because um, we are in a position as a Finance Committee to vote prior to the public forum, which is when the public has its final opportunity to speak on uh, appropriations matters. Uh, it is uh, our conclusion that the best practice is to have a joint, have this as a joint meeting. And if there are public comments that would cause a member of the committee to rethink the position that they had previously taken and would like to have the uh, finance committee reconsider recommendations, then that's uh, what this opportunity is about. And for the public um, who are watching, uh, there are four orders, two on Centennial, one withdrawing the prior financing and one approving new financing. And those were passed with uh, four councilor members of the committee in favor, uh, one member absent and the three non-voting members who are resident members of the committee in support um, on the Community Preservation Act recommendations. There are also two orders that were shown on the screen, one regarding all projects except for some, uh, the uh, Fort River Fields and uh, a separate order on Fort River Fields. It has to be separate because uh, it involves borrowing and has a different uh, requirement for passage. And it was uh, one that was, uh, both of those uh, were voted to recommend uh, uh, these uh, orders to the council. And they were on the vote of five to zero of the voting members, councilor members, two non-voting members in support and one non-voting member absent. So having given that introduction, um, I'm going to simply ask, is there any member of the Finance Committee who wishes to make a motion to reconsider any of the four previous votes that I described? Seeing no hands raised, um, I am going to assume that, therefore, that there's no request for reconsideration on any of the four orders, and uh, therefore, I am uh, going to adjourn the Finance Committee meeting. Okay. Um, and the forum is now officially closed, and we are going to move on to the regular town council meeting. Okay.
Since we have been doing this since 5.30, I am going to go through the introduction. Good evening. It is February 27th, 2023. Uh, we, I need to just check with Athena before I start. What is the status of Amherst Media? I am still waiting to hear back. I haven't heard back from them. Okay, but we are recording it and we are live on Zoom. That's correct. And that is sufficient to meet our requirements. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, it, on November 7th, 2022, an act was signed into law that extends the suspension of certain provisions of the open meeting law. This allows us to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present at a meeting location while providing the public with adequate alternative access to the meeting. This meeting is accessible in real time by Zoom, by phone, and we hope uh, Amherst Media will be joining us on channel 17. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the town council meeting of February 27, 2023 to order at 6.03. I'll call on each counselor by name. Let me know you're here. And then please mute your mic again. Shalini Balmilm. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Lynn Griesmer's present. Mandy Johanneke. Present. Anika Lopes. Present. Michelle Miller. Present. Dorothy Pam. Here. Pam Rooney. Present. Kathy Shane. I'm here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Jennifer Taub. She. Um, she's coming from very far away. She may have a bad signal. Right. I'm. I see that she's still in the meeting. Let's wait to see. Uh, Alicia Walker. Here. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, can you hear us? Let's just note for the record that Jennifer Taub may be having connectivity um, issues. Okay. Um, then, and yes. Um, she is trying to, she's trying to speak, but apparently we can't hear her. Okay. Uh, thank you for letting me know that, Pam. Jennifer, can you hear us? You may want to log out and log back in. She says she can hear you. Okay, but we need to be able to hear her um, in order for, to have her recorded as participating. So I'm again going to suggest, Jennifer, that maybe you should log out and try logging back in and also check your sound to make sure you're not muted and that you're using the right speakers. We're going to proceed and just note that Jennifer at this point is trying to connect so that we can fully hear her and she can fully hear her hear us. But at this point, she seems to be able to hear us, but we are not able to hear her. Okay, uh, we're going to go to an, the announcements and just note we have a council meeting coming up in one week. Uh, we also have a full boat of committee meetings coming up. And there are district meetings. There's already been one in District 5 just this last Saturday. I know that they're planning another one. And uh, there are a ver large variety of, of meetings um, scheduled both in districts and at other locations with regard to 
the school, um, the proposed elementary school. Okay, with that, Athena, are we ready with the um, hearing for the Eversource petition for the poll placement? That was posted for 615, so we can take care of a, a couple other things before we get to that. Okay, then why don't we go on to general public comment? There's only, gen this is the only general public comment for the evening. If you would like to make public comment, please raise your hand. There are two people showing their hands at this time, three. Are there any other people who would like to make general public comment? Okay, uh, you're welcome to express your views for up to three minutes and based upon the number of people who wish to speak. At this point, I'm only seeing three hands. The council will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during general public comment. The first person, if you'll bring them in please, is Martha Hanner. Martha, please state your name where and where you live. Martha Hanner, District 5, speaking on behalf of the Amherst League of Women Voters Racial Justice Committee. We support increased stipends for town councilors and reimbursement for the cost of child care or other family care. Diversity in town governance is a key part of the town council's commitment to the goals of racial equity, justice, and inclusion. Diverse perspectives within our governing bodies, including perspectives of working families with children, are important for representative decision-making that will benefit all of our residents. However, many of our residents experience barriers to serving on the town council or other town committees. Participation requires a large commitment of time, as you all well know, long night meetings and the significant additional time to become well informed about the wide ranging issues that town council deals with. Time is a luxury for many working families that they do not have. Moreover, it can be expensive if members need to pay for family care in order to attend meetings and town events. Increased stipends and family care reimbursement can help reduce the barriers to participation in town government and provide more accessibility for all residents to participate. The League recommends that family care reimbursement and a small stipend be considered for our town boards and committees as well to attract more diverse members and allow them to devote the necessary time to serve well. We urge the council to move forward with this proposal. Thank you. Martha, thank you for your comment. Uh, I see that Jennifer Taub has now come in and through another means. So I'm going to ask Jennifer, can you hear us? I can hear you. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, so please have the record show that. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, the next person to speak in public comment is Jennifer Ritz Sullivan. Please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hello everyone. My name is Jennifer Ritz Sullivan. I live in Goshen. Um, I'm a former resident of Amherst and I'm the COVID justice leader for Marked by COVID Massachusetts. Marked by COVID is a grassroots nonprofit leading the national movement for pandemic justice and remembrance. It's founded by and for those most harmed. And we promote health equity and pandemic prevention. We are all volunteers. As a working class, disabled immune compromised person with an essential worker husband and someone who is also COVID bereaved, the pandemic continues to impact my family as it does to the millions of others who have been marked by COVID. I am the daughter of Erla Dawn Dimitriadis, an artistic, compassionate warrior who dedicated most of her life to working with children. My 66 year old mom caught COVID before the vaccines. She spent the last two weeks of her life slowly suffocating to death, isolated in an ICU, 
alone in December of 2020. I was separated from my family and friends and we were forced to carry our grief alone without the rituals of community and memorialization that bring us comfort in times of loss. HD 3821, which was introduced by Representatives Dome and Blay, calls for the first Monday in March to be a day of remembrance for COVID in Massachusetts. And it's mirrored at a federal level by legislation introduced by Senators Warren and Marquis, calling for a COVID Memorial Day on the first Monday in March. Additionally, over 185 cities in 36 states have enacted COVID Remembrance Day resolutions. The language is primarily written by the COVID bereaved community with the members being essential and frontline workers, others long haulers, many coming from disproportionately harmed communities, including people of color, low income, disabled and high risk individuals. We see this day as a day to unite as COVID has impacted everyone. We see it as a day to extend gratitude to those essential workers who continue to help our communities and also a day of remembrance for those we've lost to COVID as well as those struggling with long COVID. This day and remembering the losses that continue to happen will assist with future pandemic prevention. We cannot prevent what we are unwilling to acknowledge. We must remember the over 24,000 COVID deaths in our state and the over 1.13 million nationally to heal. And I hope that Amherst will join us in that remembrance. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Jennifer. Lauren Mills, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Yes, hi, good evening, Lauren Mills. I live on a Long Meadow Drive and my son would like to make a public comment. My name is Jamai Proctor. I am a seventh grader at the Amherst Middle School. I like soccer, football, and I am currently playing basketball. I would like the town to consider plans for a youth center for kids like me, a youth center that is a place for to build relationships, mentorship, and friendships. Through sport, culture, and recreation, life is not a game or a gamble. When youth are supported academically and in their goals for the future, sports can teach us a lot about life and ourselves and when mistakes and obstacles come not to. We need the town to use the fund that we, that we set aside for the center to be used for that purpose. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this evening. I see no other hands for public comment. And so at this point, public comment is closed. Uh, Athena, it's still not time, right? I have 6.15 now, so we can go ahead with the okay. public hearing if you'd like. Right. Is there anybody from Eversource with us? I don't see anybody. Um, I'm expecting someone, but I don't see them right now. I, I can send an email and check in. All right. Uh, given that, I'm going to go on to the consent agenda. So if you could put that up on the screen, please do so. Mandy Jo, you have your hand up. Yeah, the consent agenda includes the petition. Um, so could we maybe just talk about the resolutions that you normally do first just to hopefully finish the hearing before we do the consent agenda? Excellent, excellent suggestion. All right, we're gonna go on to item six. We are actually referring the Tibetan National Uprising Day proclamation back to GOL because the sponsors have asked for some additional language. GOL will discuss that. Uh, at their meeting on Wednesday, and it will come back to the council on the 6th in time for us to have it completed for their event, which is on uh, March 10th. So with that, we're going to go on to the other one, which is relevant to one of our speakers this evening, and that's the COVID-19 Victims and Survivors Memorial Day Resolution. 
This was submitted by community members as well as Pat DeAngelis. And I've asked Pat to read the last portion of the resolution. Yeah, and I want to thank Jennifer uh, and Mark by COVID uh, for coming forward and bringing this to the town of Amherst. Um, I'm going to go straight to um, the final therefores, what the resolution is about. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the town council recognizes the first Monday of each March, March as COVID-19 Memorial Day in remembrance of those marked by COVID, those who have lost their lives, and in honor of those who continue to suffer from the impacts of this virus. Be it further resolved that the town council urges local residents to continue taking preventative measures as appropriate to protect vulnerable members of the community and to mitigate spread of the virus in tribute to essential workers and those who rose in service to protect the public. Thank you, Pat. Dina, I'm still not seeing anybody from Eversource. Uh, I think we should go ahead. All right. Do uh, we need to vote on the resolution? No, the resolution's on the consent agenda. Okay, thank you. Unless it gets pulled off of the consent agenda. Is there anybody that's pulling this resolution off of the consent agenda? No. All right. Then uh, I'm going to open the hearing for the Eversource poll petition. This is a petition where they are replacing one poll and adding one poll. Uh, you have in your packet a memo from them, which includes a map, and you also have a memo from Guilford Mooring. Um, are there any questions from the council? Andy. I just wanted to um, ask whether there's anyone in the attendee group who represents Hypersource. No, I sent the representative a Zoom invitation and I don't see him either in panelists or attendees. I've sent an email. Right. Thank you. Okay. Jennifer. I mean, uh, Pam Rooney. Hey, thanks. So if the if the representative isn't here, I'm not sure they can answer this question, but the abandoned pole on the north side of Meadow Street says abandoned pole to Verizon cut down five feet. Is that pole just simply going to be left there? I would hope not. Guilford, can you answer that question? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, we believe the pole is going to go away. Um, the pole has a service which goes to rise the rise building, but they, we don't think they're actually using that service. So if that service is not being used, then the whole pole will be pulled out. Okay. Pam, is that any other question about that? No, that was it. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm looking to see if there's any other counselor questions. Anna? I'm having the same problem Pam was having of, I don't know if, the, if this question makes sense to ask if there's no one here to answer it. Um, but I, you know, I mean, I think, and I apologize if I'm a bit of a broken record here, um, we should be burying as many poles as we can. And I'd like to know if this could be buried and if not, why it cannot be. Um, Guilford, do you, do you maybe know? Yeah. Guilford. Um, so this is actually a main circuit. It comes from the substation on Meadow Street, or uh, sorry, 116, close to the Sunderland Town line. Um, the pole line comes from the north, so it comes from the top of the page. There's two circuits, two primary circuits, not residential circuits or secondary circuits, on this line. And all they're doing is trying to realign it and make it a little cleaner. Right now, there's another, the circuit gets to the road um, from coming through the woods and one circuit crosses the road and one circuit turns and goes down Meadow Street. And that circuit kind of zigzags across Meadow Street. By making this change, it'll actually be a straight line down Meadow Street and you won't have to have a, a line crossing the road twice. So it actually cleans it up a little bit, um, but because there are primary lines, and because this line actually runs through the woods, it, it's it's not really a very good circuit, or there's actually three circuits there. They're not very easy to put underground. Okay. Are there any other counselor questions at this time before I go to uh, ask if there's any questions from the audience? 
Okay, then I'm going to move in. Oops, I see another one, and that is Dorothy Pam. Um, it crosses my mind that we have the same questions. One, can the pole be buried? And two, um, will this be uh, done in the leaving uh, fewer poles or and it, with some interest in, in what it looks like as well as being efficient? Um, could there be some kind of protocol? I mean, why do we have to go through it each, each time? Can't we make a statement saying that um, we would like uh, Eversource to consider these factors and to tell us if they can't meet them, why? And that would save a lot of time for everybody. So this is a real question. Yeah, no, Guilford, are those questions that you discuss with them? These are questions I do discuss with them. Um, I tell them it'd be much easier if you put it underground and then they kind of tell me why they can or cannot. Um, you're going to get, be getting a poll hearing and probably another couple of meetings. It actually is all going to be underground because the discussion has been to put things underground. Um, they do listen. The only issue we keep coming up with is there's different people assigned to different poll hearings. So mm -hmm. I we talk a lot about it over and over and over again. Yep. Yep. OK, thank you. Okay, Dorothy, thanks for raising the question. I'm going to go ask if there's any questions or public comment in favor or against from people in the audience. I'm seeing none, and I'm going to come back to the council one more time. Any further questions? Then I'm going to move that we close the hearing. Is there a second? Second, Haneke. Thank you. Uh, seeing no further questions or comments, we're going to move to a vote. All you're doing at this point is voting to close the hearing. Uh, Shalini? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna Devon Gothier? Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Jo Haneke? Aye. Nika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Yeah. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Alicia. Yes. Hello? Alicia, I didn't hear you. Are you voting yes to close the hearing? Alicia, can you hear us? Alicia, can you hear us? All right, Alicia's dropping out and trying to come back in. So I will temporarily mark her as absent and we'll, be, we'll make a note. Uh, so the vote in this case is 12 in favor, none opposed, and one absent. Ah, Alicia, you're back. Can you hear us? Oops, no. okay. Alicia, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you so okay. much. Yeah, um, my vote is yes. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. It's unanimous. And so we are now going to move on to the consent agenda. Uh, the following items were selected, although I will be making a modification to the consent agenda. They were selected because they were considered to be, be routine and passed with no controversy. If you would like to remove an, an item, please raise your hand after I go through the items and then we will decide and then we'll have I'll re I'll redo the motion. So to move the following items in the printed motions there under and approve those items as a single item. First of all, remove the adoption of the of 6A, the Tibetan National Uprising Proclamation. At the same time, I also want you to remove all of the minutes at 11 A to E. We are not ready for those this evening. So the items that still remain on the 
consent agenda are 6B, adoption of COVID-19 Victims and Survivors Memorial Day Resolution. 8F, approval of Eversource petition for poll placements on Meadow Street. 8H, authorization of town council president to sign a letter of support in support of the Protecting Community Television Act. 8I, a pro, a proposed amendments to town council rules of procedure, rule 1.4, 2.1D3, 2.1D4, 10.6, and Appendix A. And the last is referral of proposal for increase to counselor stipends and child care costs to the Finance Committee. Let me just mention on the last one, if you have any question as to whether you want this referred at all, then please ask that it be removed from the agenda. Andy? Uh, 8H, the letter regarding... Uh, okay. Table. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay. I'm sorry, 8H, Andy, is the letter protecting cable te community television act? Yes. The letter? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Just for the clarification. With that, I'm going to move to the vote. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? Aye. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Lynn. I don't think there was a second. Oh, thank you. Uh, please, I need a second. Second, Devlin Gothier. Thank you. Now we'll move to the vote. Uh, Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke? Aye. Nika Lopes? Aye. Michelle Miller? Aye. Uh, Dorothy Pam? Yes. Pam Rooney? Aye. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Aye. Jennifer Taub? Aye. Um, Alicia Walker? Aye. Chalini Bonham? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, we are going to continue on to our presentations and discussion. And Anna, uh, you have put together a presentation regarding the role of counselors as non-voting liaisons. Sure thing. Um, Athena, would you be able to pull up my <clears throat> deck? So to, to give folks context while Athena is pulling this up, there have been a couple questions about the role of liaisons in uh, the meetings that they are liaising, uh, that they're representing the, the council at in that way as a liaison. So I put together a quick outline. Um, this is all pulled directly from the council rules of procedure. Um, and I think one of the things that is really important for us to remember as liaisons is that when we are picking uh, committees to be liaisons for, it, it's actually less helpful if we're picking committees that we're very personally passionate about, because as liaisons, we lose a lot of our ability to um, engage in, in certain ways. So. Uh, for reference, you can look back to the rules of procedure, but the function of, of a liaison, the way, the, the reason we have them um, is that they're there to serve as a link between the council and the committee that they are assigned to. They're there to observe, um, <clears throat> to share information and answer questions to the degree that they can. Uh, they're, make, they're there to make sure the council is kept appraised of the work that that committee, that body is, is doing. And they're not there, <clears throat> excuse me, to advocate or promote a particular policy or course of action or stance. Uh, Athena, if you can go to the next one. So I tried to put this together in a little chart in case, like me, paragraph form isn't, isn't necessarily your, your favorite. Um, so first one feels obvious. Liaisons are not permitted to vote as a member of that body. Pretty clear. Um, liaisons are required to say who they are before they speak the first time. They must say, I am Anna Devlin Gothier. I am the council liaison to this, to this group. Um, they are allowed to ask questions and make comments during discussions if they're recognized by the chair. Um, they're not allowed to speak during public comment. So that's the, that's the shift there. Not shift, that's the differentiation there, excuse me. <clears throat> they're not permitted to express personal opinions and they're not per permitted to commit the council to action. Um, they also are only allowed to speak if the chair asks them to. So to 
clarify this, Athena, if you can go to the next one even more, I thought it might be helpful for us to look at what non-liaison counselors can do if they are attending a meeting of a different public body versus what liaisons can do. So uh, liaisons may share information and answer questions if they're asked to. They must report to the council on pending policy or budget recommendations in a timely manner. So you have to come back to us and if your, your committee is working on budget recommendations or policy recommendations. They may not advocate or promote a particular policy or course of action. They must identify before first speaking, may not speak during public comment, and may not express per personal opinions. Those are things that apply just to the liaisons. Both non-liaison counselors and liaisons may not speak on behalf of the council. They are welcome to attend meetings, but has to be as a member of the audience. So on Zoom, that means you are in the attendees, not as a member of the meeting, uh, not as a member of the panelists, excuse me. Um, and if it's an in-person meeting, it means you're sitting in the audience, not up at the front table, and may not commit the council to action. Uh, neither liaisons nor non-liaison counselors can do that. Um, Non-liaison counselors, the difference is that they are allowed to speak during public comment as a resident. We've had some folks um, ask for counselors to announce that they are speaking on their own behalf. That's not actually written into our rules of procedure or our charter right now that you have to identify if you are not the liaison, if you are just attending the meeting, but you might consider if it's best practice or not, um, whether or not you personally decide to do that. So this is where I wanna pause right now and see if there are any questions on this. Um, for folks who have liaison committees, I'd ask you to, to keep these in mind. This is in your packet. You can pull it back up um, as we are uh, engaging with the different committees that we engage with. Pam, go ahead. Have people been complaining about our participation? There have been a few times that have been brought up where folks feel that counselors are not following the rules of the liaison role. which is what prompted me to do this quick refresh. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Yep. Uh, Michelle. Thank you, Anna. Mm -hmm. um, it, so are all of the rules that you outlined in the presentation and the rules in our rules of procedure, are they per the charter or, or are they rules that we as a council could change if we wanted to? Yep, these were all pulled from the rules of procedure. So they could, I believe, be shifted um, unless I am misunderstanding. And I will ask Athena to back me up on that if I'm if I'm wrong. But these are all in the rules of procedure. Yeah, I saw them in the rules and I there is a reference in the rule on liaisons um, to the charter, but I tried clicking on it and it didn't take me anywhere. So um, I'm just... I think it's good to distinguish between what the charter requires, if anything, on this and what we have control over within our body to change if we wanted to or discuss changing. Sure. Thank you. Um, Athena, I see that your hand is up. Do you have a response? The charter simply says that non -voting under non-voting liaisons, the town council may select from among its membership non-voting liaisons to multiple member bodies the school committee and or the library trustees. This is in section 2.9B. Yep, thank you. Uh, Jennifer? Uh, so a couple of questions. So, um, it, so it seems like it is giving up a lot if a council liaison can't speak during public comment. So could they ask to go into the audience? They're still the liaison to that committee. So um, they, First off, they should already be in the audience um, as the liaison. So that's, okay. that's the so one. Then, but so then my question would be, can they? So you froze for a second. Could you repeat that? So I mean, could they? Okay. So if they're already in the audience, couldn't they speak during public comment and just state that they're speaking for themselves as a resident? My interpretation of the rules that say liaisons may not speak during com public comment would be no, um, that that they are there as the liaison, um, that they can't necessarily switch back and forth. So that's that would be my interpretation because it, it pretty clearly says liaisons may not speak during public comment in the rules. But again, those are rules that people can bring forward to be changed if they feel that that's inappropriate. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. But as of now, that is the rule until until changed. 
Um, and, and then if we want to start, I'm sorry. No, could it be referred to GOL if we wanted to, you know, if, so that would be for another matter for, to have a discussion. I don't know if it's at a retreat, if we wanted to revisit this. Sure, so it would go through the same process that the, the other rules changes that GOL just worked through, went through um, in terms of, of um, bringing that forward, yes. GOL is still working through those. So I would strongly urge that if you're going to, if you would like to send this to GOL, you do it as soon as possible and make sure that Pat DeAngelis, myself and Athena uh, receive your request. Okay. Thank you, Andy. So I just wanted to share that um, I think that this arose because when the former form of government, um, the select board had liaisons to committees and it was the conclusion of the select board at the time that having a liaison who's in that very special relationship speaking to the committee um, interferes with the appearance of the independence of the committee and the desire to have the committee have full deliberation and not feel that they are being pressured by um, the, at that point, the select board by having the liaison speak on um, an issue before the uh, committee. And I think that, you know, out of respect for the committees, the amount of time that they put in, and the fact that a lot of times issues would come back before the select board as they come back before the council. Now that that was uh, the reason for that rule. Uh, when the rules were originally adopted, um, I believe that former councillor Brewer, who was the other select board member in the last select board before the change in government, um, who became a councillor, uh, uh, felt that it should that the, the rule had made sense, and for the reasons that I've stated. So, I share that with you um, just so that you have that information as you continue this discussion. Thank you, Andy. Kathy. Having been on the rules committee, I missed the one sentence, Anna, even though it's clearly always been there. So my question, and I will go, come to GOL tomorrow, is different committees have more than just a public comment period. So for example, the Community Preservation Act committee has a public hearing before those proposals are closed. And that is quite different than public comment. You're, you're actually, people speak in favor or not, um, neighborhoods come in. And I have interpreted, although I've rarely used it, that, um, you know, example is the Ball Lane housing proposal that was up in District 1 um, and was strongly supported by people up here. Yeah, when I say up here, up in the north. So I think that is different than a public comment more generally. Um, and I'm not sure that committee in particular does have a hearing, you know, so after all, all of their discussion, then there's a point at which they open it up. So I don't think it is meant to stop all conversations. Counselors rarely come into those hearings because we get a second chance and, you know, we get to see them. So I just wanted to make that comment about that specific um, committee. Uh, and I would say the planning board sometimes when they're holding a public hearing is different than when they're having a meeting. Um, I think those are different. And I've never seen that rule as saying you can't open your mouth. Although we, we haven't always had a liaison to the planning board, so. Sure. Thank you, Athena. This is helpful to have up as we are discussing. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Pam? Um, has any, have you in this, in this reminder and refresher for us as town councilors, have you already thought about refreshing and updating the chairs of these committees that we're talking about? Because um, I think it would be appropriate if they knew that we are 
actually able to raise our hand during a discussion period, not a, necessarily a public comment period, but it would be helpful for them to know that when one sits with one's hand up for 20 minutes, you know, during a conversation, that in fact the liaison might want to say something. And that would be helpful, I think, for the chairs to understand as well. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good idea. I, um, you know, I think it's something I'm happy to share this with with committee chair, or share it with Paul to send to to chairs of committees with liaisons. I think that would be really helpful. Um, I also think it would it would be good practice for us as liaisons to share it with the chair when we start to um, in the beginning of that year long uh, appointment. But yes, that's a great suggestion. Thank you. Any other questions on this, Dorothy? So I'm interested in uh, what problem you're trying to solve with this. Um, and um, it seems as if you're saying, uh, I would think maybe you should just hire secretaries and send them into and bring a paragraph back. Uh, why would you want a town councilor to attend a meeting at which um, when they're asked by committee members, they're not allowed to answer or to give an opinion? Um, and, a re and when they give a report, they cannot give a opinion. That seems to me you would, if you want a really objective report, have a note taker make a report on the uh, committee. That is my suggestion. So I, I guess I'll answer that in two parts. Um, the first part in terms of what problem I'm trying to solve, we had some requests specifically for this topic to be a refresher um, because there were there were concerns or complaints that, that liaisons were not um, following the rules that we as a council set for ourselves, um, I think to your second point, that is exactly something that if you feel liaisons should be eliminated as a role from the council, that would be something to bring to GOL and pitch as a rules change. Um, that's that's not the intent of this. The intent of this is not actually to get is not to get into what liaisons should be. It's merely just to remind of remind folks what they currently are. Um, and if we want to change that, again, that would go through the, the process that um, we talked about just a couple minutes ago in terms of going through GOL to adjust the, uh, adjust the rules as such. I just want to add the human factor. Uh, a liaison has to attend extra meetings when there's already millions of meetings to attend. And one picks and chooses the committees one goes to beyond the ones that, that one is on. Why would a counselor add yet another committee to go to if anyone could do it. So, no okay. So really briefly, also I wanna address, um, liaisons do not actually have to attend the meetings live and in person. They just need to be appraised of what's happening on the committee. So uh, this is according to our rules. Again, if you'd like to change that, we can change those. I am I am the messenger here, y'all. I'm just repeating the rules. I know. So, so, but I'm um, gonna say, that if, if you have to find out by watching the meeting, that's time. I hear if you. Somebody gives you a report. Well, they could give the report in the first place without the liaison having to get involved in the middle. You know, so it's just there's there's I don't see the logic of how this comes together because to, the counselor's time, truthfully, is pretty precious and very oversubscribed. We have many, many things to do. So if anyone could do it and they don't and our personal opinion, thoughts or whatever, or relationship with anyone on the committee doesn't matter, then I don't see why a counselor really would do it. Thank you, Dorothy. I look forward to hearing your proposals for the rule changes. Thank you. Um, Mandy. Thank you. It, you know, reading the rules, um, it sounds like uh, the council is not in agreement as to the purpose of a liaison, which might be wise to send to GOL. Um, these rules were originally adopted with the purpose sort of that um, Andy indicated, you know, a way to liaise between the council and those committees that bring items to the council to so that someone could answer questions about when is this best on the council agenda? Um, how do we get it to the council agenda? Um, things like that. Um, they were not there to put in so that um, councilors would have a seat at the table, would be intimately involved in the discussions of those committees. Um, and But it sounds like maybe we as a council body or at least counselors coming to the table have different opinions on the purpose of liaisons um, and that might be worth a discussion at GOL then. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Michelle? 
Um, this is kind of a process question and I'm not, I'm a little hesitant, but I just, I, I feel like I, I just want to address it. Um, like you said, Anna, that you're the messenger and you said that there were certain complaints uh, about particular counselors who weren't following the rules. And I'm just wondering like how we might have a bit of a more friendly way of like interacting with each other as counselors. Like, did anybody call that counselor up? If you're the one who received the complaint, for example, did you call that counselor up and say, hey, you know, I've gotten this complaint and, um, you know, I wanted to just remind you of the rules because um, it just feels like going from like hearing that there are certain counselors who violated the rules and which complaints came to it's not even clear whether they came to you or to Lynn or if you heard them through some other channel. It just feels like there's some lacking of transparency and like friendliness in the way that we're approaching this. Like, um, and I'm just wondering like what that's about. Cause I saw this on the agenda and I really had no idea what it was about. I didn't, I tried to look for something. I didn't, I couldn't find anything. Um, so could you be more clear? Like, did somebody come to you and complain and say that a particular counselor was violating the rules? Did they come to Lynn and then Lynn asked you to put this together to remind people? Um, and did you contact that counselor if you were the one that received the complaint or did Lynn contact that counselor? Sure. Or so, I, sure. I think, you know, one, the, the, some emails have come to both Lynn and myself. I believe Lynn has gotten some on her own, but I'll let her speak to that. Um, honestly, I, I, this might be just a difference in our perspective and understanding of what's friendly or not, but I thought a rule refresh for everyone was the kinder option um, versus telling somebody that they had been, you know, had received their, there was, con there were concerns specifically about their conduct. I thought that reminding all of us, and I think based on the number of questions, it seems clear that a refresh might have been helpful for more than just one or two of us. Um, so for me, the, the opportunity to bring this neutrally as a reminder of what the rules are to the council instead of um, even privately having a, a call out of one person felt like the kinder option and felt like the more more of the leaning into the learning opportunity from this. Um, but that again is my perspective. And uh, if folks would prefer these be handled differently, that's fine. I think that that's where um, the person, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll end it there. The, the if I could just respond. Oh, go ahead, Lynn. Oh, the confusion is not just what is your role as a liaison, but it is what is your role as a counselor if you attend a meeting and you want to make public comment. And so this was an opportunity to look at both sides of that one. Are you in the meeting as a liaison? And if you are, these are the, these are the guidelines we go by. If you're in a meeting and you're there as in the audience and you make public comment and you're a counselor and you say, you know, I'm so-and-so counselor from such and such, and I'm making public comment as an individual resident, not on behalf of the council, that's also your privilege. So it's a way of clarifying this. We actually usually do a clarification of liaison positions once a year. We did provide a, something in the packet when we did do the liaisons just back in January. Um, and much of this has occurred since then. So it's not just issues of liaisons, it's issues of what can counselors do or not do at council at other committee meetings. And it's not I, yeah, and I, I just want to respond. I'm not, I, I, I appreciate the refresher. It's not that I don't appreciate the refresher. And I don't think, you know, I think that the refresher is good to do. It just seems like there's something between what, like, the origin. Okay. Michelle, I I'm wondering if you could just you go give there. me it. <laughs> okay. I mean, there's no conspiracy here. It's it, a refresher for all of us. Okay. Sorry, can I, 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 I'd like to just hear Michelle's question. I didn't think I caught it. I mean, it. I, I, <laughs> that's okay. 
Okay. Um, Shalini? Yeah, I, um, I think it was really helpful to me to understand um, this present, even though I'm not a liaison. So I was actually going to say thank you for a very beautiful presentation, which I think all of us agree that's not the disagreement here, but I just wanted to thank you for making that. Uh, I did want to say, though, that I think it is a disincentive to people who are really interested, um, counselors who are really interested in a committee to not be able to speak, not as a liaison, but I think the important thing, and that's when y'all go into GOL, like maybe that can be clarified is that, you know, as a liaison, they have to be objective and they do play a role, Dorothy, more than a secretary would because they, they in case a question is asked about a process or you know a policy that only a counselor would know i think they are there to provide that sort of be a resource to the committees um but then if they do want to make a comment i think the ability to you know step back and be very clear that i'm speaking as an individual of the you know whatever that language is um i think so that option should be made available thank you i think um yeah, again, I would encourage folks who have, I look forward to, to um, seeing this discussion at GOL. It seems like there are a lot of changes folks would like to see. Uh, Alicia. Thank you, Anna. Um, I, I do think it was helpful to have a refresher because um, some of those things were a reminder to me. So it was helpful, but I also think it might be helpful to establish some sort of process because I think a specific counselor might want to know if someone is complaining about their actions. I know I personally would want to know if someone had an issue uh, with something that I was doing. And so maybe there can be a process for which that person can be notified if there are formal complaints being made to the president and the vice president about a specific counselor. I think that would be important for them to know. Um, yeah, and I think that could be possibly worked into the rules as well if that were something that people wanted to see about violations of the liaison rules or something. Uh, Michelle? I'm sorry, I just wanna, I, I think clearing the air on this is really important. And I feel like there was just a harm done um, and I just need to address it. And um, Lynn, I feel like you suggesting that my question was somehow a conspiracy theory is so deeply upsetting. Um, I don't, I don't know at all. I can't even imagine what you mean by that, but I, you shut me down completely when I was genuinely trying to address something that was important to me. I apologize for shutting you down. Thank you. Um, any other questions on this? Okay, well, it looks like um, Pat, GOL should be getting some exciting suggestions for rule changes and you're welcome for uh, the unintentional, I swear it was unintentional, uh, item for GOL to discuss. And thank you all so much. I'm happy to do other uh, visual rules refreshes. We don't need to limit it to liaisons if folks would ever um, like that. and. Um, I know that GOL does them too, so maybe that's actually more appropriate to come from them anyway. Uh, Dorothy. Um, Anna, what program did you use? Those were very gifted charts. I don't agree with a couple of the items, but it was really great chart making. And um, what program or how did you do that? Thank you. Um, I, for those ones, I believe I used Canva. Canvas? Canva, C-A-N-V-A. -N Okay, not thank you. Placement, not a Canva influencer, I swear. Thank you. Of course. Um, all right, Lynn, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Great, thank you. Um, on the uh, timing and order of the agenda tonight, I suggested we would have two breaks. One of them is at seven. And so it is two minutes of seven. So we're going to take a break and reconvene at 7.10. Please shut off your mic and when you come back, turn your picture back on.
Please shut your mic down.
As you return, please uh, put your video on so I know you're back. As you uh, return, please turn your video on so I know you're back. And Dorothy, I think your hand is up from the past discussion. Thank you. And I just wanna note that Alicia is having some difficulty, so she appears on the screen twice because she's using one for audio and the other one for visual. So um, there we, go. we are going to go on to the action, uh, action items. The first item is the elementary school building project. Uh, the first item is particularly the debt exclusion language. Uh, as discussed in the finance committee meeting, I'm going to call on Andy Steinberg and he can give that report. So I really don't particularly want to say a lot because uh, we did a lot of work on writing the committee report and I'm assuming that everybody get a chance to read it and, and ask questions. I think that the basic point that we came up with regarding the language is um, actually already presented to us at a prior meeting by the town manager and the finance director. And that is that uh, the statute that uh, establishes the procedures for debt exclusion and uh, is very clear as to what the language is. And um, to the extent that it has some pieces that need to be filled in, that the Mass School Building Authority does that and um, is very specific about what they are looking for. And uh, <clears throat> the discussion at the committee meeting was about things we wished we could have as additional because we realized that this is highly technical language, but we cannot put anything on the ballot. And uh, we've we determined that in addition to not being able to say anything on the ballot, that a yes vote means this, a no vote means this, um, that we can also not produce anything and have it distributed within the uh, same zone for distribution, distribution of literature that would apply to a candidate. And uh, so it's um, really, we have to rely on the campaign format and what we do in educating voters before the election. So I okay. think uh, that is the best quick summary I can give. Thank you. Uh, with that, I'm gonna put a motion on the floor, seek a second and then see if there's any other counselor questions or comments. 
uh, we move that the town council vote to place a proposition two and a half debt exclusion question on the May 2nd, 2023 town special election ballot for Amherst voters, which reads, shall the city known as the town of Amherst be allowed to exempt from the provision of proposition two and one half, so-called the amounts required to pay for the bonds issued in order to construct originally equip and furnish an elementary school on the Fort River site located at 7 Southeast Street, Amherst, Massachusetts, including the cost of architectural design, project management, demolition of the existing building and other necessary site improvements and all costs incidental and related to thereof. The ballot would then also say yes or no. Is there a second? Second, Governor. I'm sorry, who? Uh, I think Anna, you second. I think Pat also said it. I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Anna. It's fine. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments with regard to this particular motion? Sean, please join us. Only because you, you read it, and I just want to make sure. Um, it reads exactly as it's been approved. Mm -hmm. At the end, I think you said there too of. I just want to make, is that in the version that you have? Again, I know it's a minor uh, thing, but I just want to make sure. A demolition of the existing building. Yep. It's there. And, and then and then finish the, can you just finish that sentence and as you other, have it? Yes. And other necessary site improvements and all costs incidental and related thereto. Okay, perfect. That's not what I have. Okay. I appreciate your being very precise on the language because they you. are very precise on the language. Are there any other questions, Kathy? Uh, it's not a question so much as a comment. Um, as you can see in Andy's report, uh, we had a discussion that for many people, you would read those words and go, excuse me. Um, and so the staff is working on a what this means is the following. Um, so to a basic little information guide to this. Um, and I uh, cross-checked multiple towns who are out for debt exclusion and they all have the same, what you would might call it arcane language. So it's it's we're not unusual for this. So I just wanted to make a comment that anyone who says, you know, how do I explain that? You will, we will have something simple that explains it. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions? I just want to note that there's 14 people in the audience at this point, in addition to those of us on the screen. Um, with that, I'm going to move to the question. And in this case, you, the question is, are we placing this question, this question on the ballot on May 5th as we checked the wording? Okay. I'll begin and with- you said May 2nd, yes? I'm May 2nd. Did mm -hmm. I say May 5th again? May 2nd, May 2nd, May 2. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to begin with uh, Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmers, an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Pam, uh, Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shanley Balmil. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. It is unanimous. We are going to go on to the rest of this discussion and have a motion thereof. And it is regarding the actual um, issue relating to a special election date, early voting and mail-in voting. Uh, Sue Audette, our town clerk has joined us. And so if we have questions for, of her, we can ask them. But for the purposes of this discussion, I'm gonna place them following motion on the floor and look for a second to call a special election in the city known as the town of Amherst on May 2nd, 
2023 for the purpose of seeking a debt exclusion and to allow early and mail-in voting for said election. Is there a second? Shane seconds. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Let me ask Sue, in the past, um, we've usually had early voting on the five days before, um, in the week before, that usually ends on Friday. And there's also usually been one evening, I believe it's Thursday, that we've uh, been open till around eight o'clock. Is that your intention? No, actually, the Board of Registrars recommended four days, a Monday through Thursday, normal business hours, which is what the law states that we have to do. Um, it's changed multiple times throughout the years, so it depends on what the last day to register to vote. I think that's what you're referring to, and that's when we would have been open until 8 o'clock, but that has changed to 10 days before elections now, which always falls on a Saturday. Um, so those don't line up any longer. Um, so basically, the law just states that we do it in the town clerk's office during normal business hours, which is what the Board of Registrars stuck with. But so just Monday. Will you be using the small meeting room down the hall from town clerk? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, the voters are, are pretty familiar with that location. Right. And signs can be posted outside. Yeah. As usual, we would do the normal thing. Yeah. Are there questions of Sue or anybody else regarding this this motion. Kathy? Uh, it's not a question. It's just, could you tell me, Sue, with what you just said, what would be the first day of early voting? I'm just looking at a calendar. The second is a Tuesday in May. Um, it, would it, it would be April 24th. It would be Monday, April 24th. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome which is the day school resumes after the spring break. Okay, I just I just wanted to know what, exactly which day, thank you. Okay. And, right. and yeah, and I'm partly, I'm updating the website for the project on Sean doing so just so that we can put information accurately. Okay. And uh, Sue, those hours would be eight to four? No, eight to 4.30. Eight to 4.30, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, are there any other questions or comments? Anika? Yes, I have a question for Sue. When would the ballots be mailed out? So um, once I get the language, once it's been approved, um, it comes to me and then I can send that to our vendor and they would make up the ballots. So it's a process we have to go through. So as soon as they get them to us, then they start being mailed out. But I need the language first, which has been voted and, and vetted and all of that. Um, so it usually takes the vendor from past experience um, about a week. We go through a back and forth with proofing process, making sure everything is perfect. Um, so as soon as that gets to me, I will get the ball rolling. So it just all depends on when it gets to me. So there's not a, a ballpark at this point. Just, I mean, if I were to get the language, if it's finalized, I, I would have to ask town manager. Um, but um, if I were to get the language this week, technically, um, we have we can't just mail the ballots out yet. The state actually is waiting on us to vote this date, which you've just done. Tomorrow we can go and, and let them know, okay, the states, the, I mean, the town council has voted the date and they haven't entered this date into the voter registration system. We haven't been able to enter applications for ballots until that's been done. Everything's been held up based on the vote of tonight. So things are gonna start happening quickly once we get back into the office. So we have to input all of the applications. We have about 400 of them right now for an early uh, vote by mail ballot. Once those are put in the system, once the ballots are, are arrive at our office, then we can start mailing ballots out. So I'm guessing um, definitely by the beginning of April, hopefully sooner. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I also note that in our census forms that were sent out, there were uh, blanks to request that you get mail-in ballots. 
And uh, I know in our census form, we got one yellow sheet, but I went to town hall and they said, you can just make a copy on a white sheet. We accept that. And you can submit it for any member of your family that wishes to have a mail-in ballot. Uh, Pam Rooney. Thanks. Uh, so in this mailing, is there any opportunity to put in the slip of paper that says a yes vote means X and a Y vote means, and a no vote means Y? Um, or is that also not legal? And that you mean with the ballot, when the ballot goes out? I don't think it's legal, um, town manager, no, because we can't uh, provide red booklets. And I think that might fall under the same category of explanation. Um, we'd have to check on, we'd have to check on that. Yeah, we'll wanna but make have, sure that we determine I have, that. I have to follow up then. Um, is there a plan to put something out as a general mailing for people to be informed, not only that there's a vote, what it's for, what does it mean? Um, if we don't have a red booklet, can we have a red letter? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Paul, you have your hand up. Yeah, so the town can't expend funds um, to influence um, the vote in any way, shape or form. We can put information on the website um, then advocates groups can take that and mail it to whoever they'd like, um, if they'd like to use it. Um, but we can't do promotional and whatever we put, people could interpret that to be promotional um, if we mail it to every resident on this. So we're not allowed to be sending, using taxpayer dollar to do that kind of thing. Okay, Pam, does that answer your question? Okay. Are there any other questions? Kathy. It's not a question as much, but if we can't give people any information and we mail them a ballot, is I hesitate to ask this question, but is a mail ballot for this, does it make sense? Because when we're when we had our other ballots, we got the red booklets full. So complicated things, you know, I, I know we can't do that, but we would from another from the state would come, you've got these four extra things to vote on. So we we just have to make sure that all of us can tell people where to get the one page, where to go on the town website to explain this um, to them. So that's the, uh, that's my only concern about mailing. You're going to be looking at this wording. Um, so I think we can do a good job to have other people do this. So I'll stop talking. Okay. But it's, it's to not be able to explain what you're voting on is difficult. Yeah. It's sure not so. like voting for a governor, not voting for a governor. I mean, this is different. Paul, you had your hand up again. Yeah. So, so the red book is done by the secretary of state's office and mm -hmm. they get proponents and opponents of the two uh, of, uh, on the ballot questions about what does a yes vote mean? What does a no vote mean um, in terms of, and they, the advocate groups get to define what that means. So uh, we don't really, you know, yeah. under, under, under prop two and a half, that's a limitation. I think we're, so yes, we're just limited on what the town can expend funds on. And we don't want to, you know, we want to make sure that we abide by the law ex very precisely because, you know, we don't want there to be a challenge to this vote. Correct. Yep. Dorothy. So what about, you're going to have a lovely web page somewhere. What about if some of us volunteer to hand stamp envelopes with a little thing, look on um, and with the, with like the email address of where they'd find this thing on the town webpage. No money is expended. And we've just referred them to a place that might have more information. Oh, you're saying on the envelopes with the ballots in it? Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting idea. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I, I doubt that's allowed, but um, we can we can certainly check with it. Okay. Sue, do you know? Um, yeah, we'd have to check on that, but I just want to point out that that's only going to go to the ones that have requested mailed ballots, which is not everyone. So now it's excluding a group of people. Yeah. Okay. And these are great questions. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to move to the vote. Uh, I begin with Lynn Griesmer and I'm a yay. Mandy Jo Hanneke? Aye. Um, Anika Lopes? 
Aye. Michelle Miller? Aye. Dorothy Pam? Yes. Pam Rooney? Yes. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Aye. Jennifer Taub? Mm, Jennifer, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I voted yes. Thank you. Uh, Alicia Walker? Yes. Shalini Balmilm? Yes. Pat Angelus. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? Aye. It's unanimous. Sue, uh, thank you for being with us and uh, thank you for all the help you're going to be giving us in these next busy weeks. We appreciate that. Okay. You're very welcome. Thank you. Great. Um, earlier today, we had a public forum on the Community Preservation Act allocations. There's two votes that we must take. Uh, we'll put those motions on the floor. We'll put one motion on the floor and then look for a second, see if there's any discussion and proceed with the next one. The first motion is in accordance with charter section 5.6 having been published on the town bulletin board for a minimum of 10 days on February 13th, 2023, a public forum held on February 27th, 2023, and having been reviewed by the Finance Committee report of February 27th, 2023, to adopt Council Order FY24 07A, an order appropriating the FY 2024 Community Preservation Act budget as shown on page 13 to 14 of the motion sheet. Is there a second? Second, Rooney. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Seeing none, I'm going to move to a vote. I'm starting with Mandy Jo Haneke. Aye. Nika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shelley Balmill. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Dean Greasemers and I. It is unanimous. The second is actually an appropriation and authorizing debt. The motion is as follows. In accordance with chapter, I'm sorry, with charter section 5.6 having been published on the town bulletin board for a minimum of 10 days on February 13th, 2023, a public forum held on February 27th, 2023, and having been reviewed by the finance committee report of February 27th, 2023 to adopt Council Order FY24 08A, an order appropriating and authorizing debt for the replacement and improvements of the Fort River School fields under recreation as shown on page 15 of the motion sheet. Is there a second? Second, Rooney. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Mandy Joe? Just two. Um, the first one is there seems to be a hanging and, and I'm not sure if we're missing something wording wise at the end of the now therefore. Um, and then the second was, I thought the CPA committee uh, recommended this contingent on the debt exclusion passing, but I see nothing in the order that has that contingency. So I'm curious um, if, if we are voting it without that contingency or if we want that contingency and if so where do we put it in this order um is sean with us still but i can answer too yeah i'm still here sean go ahead um i'm looking for the order just to see if there's anything missing um in regards to the contingency we spoke about that with uh, a finance committee um and we consulted sonia who put the order together and and this is sort of a common thing that comes up, which is there's a, a memo that goes with the order that describes the order and in there talks about the contingency. Um, and this, I think the CPA report itself may even um, specify that there was a contingency. Um, so we felt that because it's been pretty, that the whole project is sort of based on this the school project moving forward. 
um, that it didn't need to be explicitly laid out um, because there, there really is no project if the school project doesn't move forward. So the discussion at CPA is that if, again, if it doesn't move forward, then this would be rescinded. Okay. Uh, Sean, did you have a chance to look at the um, order? I should be able to get that in one second. Give me one more minute. Mm -hmm. Kathy? Um, yep. Mandy, I asked the same question in finance, and I didn't go back and check it, but I was told that we did the same thing with the Jones Library, that in the CPA wording, it was clearly contingent, but in the order, it, it was just the money. Um, so it's linked to that allocation that they've made. Because I had also asked why don't we have a contingent in here um, and was told we didn't need it. Mandy Jo. I thought we added it into the order or at least a reference to the memo into the order because I worry our if we read our motion, our motion just says adopts the order. It references no memo, no nothing other than the order and the order doesn't talk about the memo. The order doesn't talk about anything. And so I thought with the library money, we had put it, put something in the order that referenced the contingency or the memo that had the contingency in it. Um, and I guess I'd feel a lot more comfortable if um, either the motion includes the comma contingents on the elementary school building project going forward or whether the order says that because our motion itself simply says adopt the order which means we're adopting the language in the order and nothing else in my reading of it so lynn real quick on the hanging and you can just delete the and and so is yeah. there a period after it, it's just a comma order? and then it, they're town therefore and then it goes down to uh where you sign I see. Okay. Do you have the memo handy? Uh, I I think it's actually a report. Sorry. I think it's actually the CPA report that's in the packet. Okay. And Athena, if you had a moment and could check what we finally did with the library, that would be useful. So we just ask for everybody's patience. So, um, Lynn, in the report uh, under this project, it says the funding recommendation is contingent upon town residents voting to pass the school debt exclusion override later this spring. Okay, so the question then is, do we refer to the report? And that's what Athena is looking at. She's looking at what we, what we did with the library. This is, this is actually the report for the library, right? Yeah. Could Athena scroll up to the before the now, therefore? Because I thought that might be. Okay. I mean, I think the difference with this one was that there were two votes. There's there's no debt exclusion. I mean, that's one difference is there's no debt exclusion as part of the library project. So the funding sort of happened right after this vote. It either happened right before or right after. I can't remember uh, the order that these votes were taken in, but um, there wasn't as much really contingency as it related to that vote. And Athena is now showing us the vote. So it was as presented. Mandy Jo, do you want to make a motion to amend? I guess not, as long as it's clear that it's contingent upon the debt exclusion passing. Okay. All right. Are there other questions? 
Seeing none, I'm going to move to a vote uh, in this case. I'm actually beginning with Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy mm -hmm. Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Chalini Balmill? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Jo Haneke? Aye. It's unanimous. We're going to move on to the Centennial Plant. We also had a public forum on this today. We have two actions we have to take. One is to rescind our previous order, and the second is to authorize a new order. The motion for rescission is as follows. In accordance with Charter Section 5.6, having been published on the Town Bulletin Board for a minimum of 10 days on February 13th, 2023, a public forum held on February 27th, 2023, and having been reviewed by the Finance Committee Report of February 27th, 2023, to adopt appropriation and transfer order FY23-23. 13C, an order rescinding authorization but unissued bonds as shown on page 16 of the motion sheet. Is there a second? A point of order before the second. Yeah. Sorry, I think I copied that whole everything before the to adopt to the wrong motion in the centennial. You no, know, I wondered the decision about decision doesn't have, it should just start with to adopt and then the second motion number two should have all of that in accordance with charter section. Okay, why I'm don't you, why don't you read one, the, I think. Yeah, why don't you read the motion for the rescission the way it should be read? So I think the rescission is just to adopt appropriation and transfer order FY20, Three. Yeah, hold on. FY twenty three dash thirteen C, an order rescinding unauthorized but unissued bonds, as shown on page sixteen. Okay. Um, I think I will... Athena, that's how we did it last time, right? Yes, Athena. Is did you have any problem with that motion? Athena? Nope, that motion is fine. Okay, then I second that motion. This motion that we're dealing with now is merely to rescind the previous financial order. Mindy Jo, you have your hand up. Okay, are there any questions regarding the rescission of the previous financial order? Okay, in that case, I'm gonna to move to Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam? Yes. Pam Rooney? Yes. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Aye. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Alicia Walker? Yes. Shanley Belmill? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? Aye. Lynn Griesmer? Aye. Mandy Johanneke? Aye. Anika Lopes? Aye. Thank you, it's unanimous. Okay, Mandy Jo, I'm gonna have you make the next um, motion since- okay. I apologize for having put it into the wrong spot. So in accordance with charter section 5.6, having been published on the town bulletin board for a minimum of 10 days on February 13, 2023, a public forum held on February 27, 2023, and having been reviewed by the finance committee report of February 27, 2023, to adopt appropriation and transfer order FY23 09A, an order approving and authorizing borrowing to fund capital projects bond authorization as, um, as shown on page 17. Second, is there any question? This is the actual authorization. And Sean explained uh, the various pieces with all the financing and the loans and the forgiveness during our public forum. And 
we hope this is the end. Pam Rooney. So this is not, um, you know, are we going to go with with um, level principal or or level um, payments? That's not the conversation right now, right? That's no. correct. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. Sean, go ahead. Uh, no. Um, so with the, the state revolving fund, we can still pick which option we want to go to, or at least um, submit our preferences to the state because they will take that into account when they structure our loan with them as well. Um, again, because of the, the higher costs and the higher interest rates, we're probably looking at the level payment option to, to moderate the, the increases in any one year. Um, but again, that's, that's ultimately a decision of the, the town uh, treasurer and the town manager. Okay. So what, you... Yeah. So at what point do we have conversations about um, the costs that are projected for that? Uh, I was looking at the percent that's, that's being charged for um, the engineering fees, and they seem really high. They're like seven, so almost seven and a half percent of the construction. And I don't know when we, you know, when do we actually decide what the amount is that we're appropriating? Um, so this order is appropriating the full amount of the project, both for construction and for um, and for design and engineering. Um, engineering, at least in my experience, is typically between nine and eleven percent of construction costs. That's sort of the rule of thumb. Um, it's at times fluctuated higher than that. I think now it's maybe fluctuating on the lower side because construction costs have gone so far up. Um, but generally around that 10% is what we look at as a as a benchmark for design and engineering costs. But the appropriation That's, in front of you is for all for everything. Okay, but but those are those are this is we're only talking about construction administration. We're not talking about design, you know. Oh so yeah, if you're only talking about the construction administration phase, then you're right, it's much lower than the 10%. Yeah. I mean, the whole, I mean, the design engineering for the whole project is around 10% of construction. Right. So this phase of it, which is just construction. Guilford, you may want to um, weigh in on the design engineering fee because you've been going back and forth with um, Tate and Howard. Is that fee set in stone or is it a budget at this point? So the fee that you see in your, in your, um, in the appropriation is actually not to exceed number. And we're actually still talking to them to get the, the construction oversight fees lower. Um, and we have a couple of things we can do and the things we're talking about. But uh, the SRF fund requires full-time construction, construction monitoring. So that's why we have the number for full-time construction monitoring in this number here. And then we have the ability to adjust it down by either using our people are using their people and then actually reducing the number, but we've actually accounted for it for SRF, the, the state revolving fund. Wow. Oh, okay. Thank you. It seems very high. Well, we're actually being told by some designers to look for 20% soon. I'm in the wrong business. Yeah, we retired too soon. Yeah. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay, then we're going to move to the vote on this. And I think I'm beginning with Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney? Yes. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Aye. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Alicia Walker? Yes. Shalini Balmil. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Dean Griesmers and I, Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Oh, it's unanimous. We're going to go to the water and sewer line ownership. And uh, let me just introduce this, but let me just take one moment. You're muted. I know. I, I needed to ask that others in my household go off the internet because of instability on my internet. Um, so 
Um, two committees in the town council have looked at, many committees have spent a lot of time on these. Two committees particularly looked at this and voted differently with regard to the recommendation as to when and how there should be a change in ownership of the water and sewer lines covered by town-owned property that are presently paid for if they break by residents. I'm going to call on Anika, Town Services and Outreach Committee, to explain their vote. And I'm going to call on the Finance Committee, Andy, to explain their vote. So Anika. Thank you. Um, I was actually going to call, I did uh, submit the report, but I was actually going to call on Anna, who chaired the meeting, um, <clears throat> to give us that update in depth. Thank you. Sure. So thanks, Anika. The way that TSO approached this was that we felt um, ultimately that we wanted to see the, the major change in these regulations be that, or we wanted to see the major change of the ownership in the line be from the town property line to the main um, that shift to the responsibility shift to the town my sentences are coming out backwards sorry let me let me fix that so no. the the way that um tso discussed this we felt it was um you know, folks can't necessarily control what happens on top of property that is not theirs. And for them to then be responsible for the lines that run underneath property that is not theirs, despite not being able to control the environment uh, that might impact those pipes, it felt like a miss for our town. And we felt that the, the responsibility and the change in ownership needed to happen. Um, we also recognize that there's a lot of unknowns in shifting that amount of ownership. And so we agreed that this should be something that goes into effect in two years um, and that the that gives the town and our and our fabulous DPW staff time to really um, understand the impact of the decision. Where the discrepancy or where the difference lies is that, and, and Andy will speak for finance, but the way TSO said it, we would like this to essentially go into effect in two years unless acted upon by an outside source. That outside source being council, being town staff making a recommendation to council that this not go into effect um, in some capacity. Finance, um, Andy will explain, had the, the uh, sort of opposite of it wouldn't go into effect unless the council chose to revisit this. So I think that for us, TSO felt, uh, or TSO voted to have it go automatically in so that um, it would automatically be at least on the agenda, right? It wouldn't necessarily be up to an individual counselor or staff to say, we want to bring this huge idea back. We would have the time to revisit, but we are, we are committing to the town that we're following through on taking this action to support folks only being responsible for the things that are on their property. Uh, and at the end of the day, that was really where that decision came through. Uh, Anika, is there anything that I missed? I think you covered it and um, thank you for chairing the meeting in my absence. Thank you. Sure. And I also would like to just publicly and um, have the council do a little round of applause or, or ASL applause, whatever you choose for Amy Rusecki, who has completely shepherded this through from start to finish. I, I can't I can't even describe how much work Amy has done. Um, so truly, truly massive. Thank you. We are incredibly lucky to have you. Thank you. Right. Uh, and with that, Lynn, I'm done. So Andy. Uh, finance committee. So I'm going to actually um, do two things tonight. I'm going to ask to be recognized later to um, say a little bit more from a personal perspective in support, but I want to try and limit the presentation I'll make now to be very brief because it was covered fairly thoroughly in the report. And uh, uh, give the, the major reason why we think that the appropriate action is to uh, not enact the uh, any change at this point. It's basically that the recommendation that we received from uh, the uh, town manager and uh, uh, actually, it started with the recommendation for the finance director 
um, but it has now been also recommended by town manager and uh, uh, the assistant superintendent of public works um, is that there's a lot of information that is not presently available that the reason for the suggestion of a two-year delay was because of the amount of information that is not now known and uh, that it, therefore to take the step of saying we adopt it unless it's re um, rescinded later seems backwards from where the idea that we need more information in order to make a knowledgeable decision. And it was on that basis that after this was uh, gone through um, and we realized that there was a difference in the approach taken by the two committees, and it came back to the finance committee and the finance committee um, as reported in, um, in writing, <clears throat> basically felt that it was uh, more appropriate to assure that um, there be a uh, review by the council at the time after there's more information available and that uh, that was uh, uh, a recommendation that there was not a vote in the committee change that recommendation and we let the original recommendation stand and uh, I will say a little bit more um, by raising my hand after um, now that I'm completing this report. So the decision before the council tonight is not about approval or not of the bylaw or the regulations. It's merely about what it is we want um, Amy and Guilford and Paul to come back with, do we want them to have this to happen on a date certain July 1st, 2025, with the option that the council that's seated at that time could still change it? Or do we want to have it remain open and assume that in about two years, they would come back and there might be additional information one way or another that would determine whether or not the council wants to move forward with changing who owns what. So um, I, I, what I would like to do is not um, redo the debates in each of the committees, have people express their opinions and then move to the vote. Uh, the vote, the motion, the way it's written, gives us the way of going one or the other option. So, Andy, you had your hand raised. Yes. So, um, obviously, now you know that uh, there are two committees have uh, taken different opinions. Both Anna and I are on both committees, which puts us in a position where we've uh, had the opportunity to the debate in both committees and talk and uh, sort of have an ongoing dialogue about it that way. Um, the as I said a couple of minutes ago in the report, um, we, the finance director uh, raised some very important issues that need to be resolved. The reason that I uh, wanted the additional time is that since we've had the discussion, in the two committees, I have, uh, it's come to my attention that there are th some major issues that we did not discuss in the committees. We did not consider because we didn't even um, think to resolve them other than we do want to acknowledge, or at least I want to acknowledge that um, the uh, Bilford and Amy Secchi had uh, indicated very clearly that we needed to think about questions of fairness. Um, but there were several issues that arose, starting with um, a letter I received from a constituent on a private way. And she was pointing out that uh, because she's in a private way, uh, that uh, it was not clear in the regulation that if there was a change in ownership, 
what the change in ownership would be or whether there was any opportunity to um, for her uh, if something happened to the line leading to her house to know what benefits she would attain yet she would have to pay the water rates and she was raising whether it was equitable to require customers in the situation of people being on private ways because the whole thing is worded about um, start, the ownership starts when the um, uh, um, at, at, the, at the point of the private way, and that that la there, there's a lack of clarity about that and what it means. For, but she would have to pay the higher water rates nonetheless. Um, that caused uh, me to think about two other situations that also raised similar questions that were not discussed in either committee. One being apartment complexes but in apartment buildings, because we know that um, the uh, rule uh, was tied to um, the uh, where, where the meter is and uh, uh, in, in where the box is. And Amy uh, or Guilford can explain this a little better than I can, but um, there's uh, it, it's unclear as to what happens with apartment buildings because uh, the way that it is uh, arranged and that there's at the same time lack of clarity as to whether there's if there's sub metering and there's direct payment of water bills by the or in sewer bills by the um, residents or if it's absorbed somehow into the rent that they're still paying the increase but it's not clear that they would benefit. The third group uh, is that we have residents who don't live in Amherst. We serve some people um, in Pelham and some people in Leverett with, with either water or sewer or both, I think. But in any event, it's a, there's a lack of clarity as to whether they gain any benefit, but they would pay higher rates. And so that there's a whole group of issues that was not even considered by either committee. And if we want to make sure that the next council, because it won't be this entire group, some of us probably are not going to be involved, no, will be new counselors. And uh, but whether that's true or not, um, that it is important to assure that there be a full and complete investigation and discussion at the time. And the only way you can assure that is to um, adopt the proposal from the Finance Committee that it not go into effect now. And uh, that requires that there be a, a, a procedure in order to make the change that we're talking about. And uh, so for those reasons, um, I think that it's really the appropriate thing to not make this decision now to adopt this new policy, but to put it off until the information is fully explored and fairly explored, and we're making sure that we've thought of all customers who are being equitable. Thank you. Um, I'm, I do want to remind counselors to limit their comments to three minutes at most. Anna. Thanks. Can we restart the clock? I want my nine seconds back. Um, all right. So thank you. I, you know, I mean, I, I completely disagree with Andy. I think that's pretty clear from the, from the get-go. I think that if you look at the motion sheet, here's where my concern lies. You know, uh, Lynn, you, you said the word assume. And I think that anytime we talk about making assumptions, I, I don't like it. I don't like the, I don't like saying we assume that this will come back up in, in two years that people will wanna revisit. If you look at the motion sheet, the way that the motion would be framed is that it's it would be to request the changes without an automatic service line ownership change. There's nothing about revisiting it in two years. I think it's important to say that it would go into effect in two years because it commits us to doing that research, asking those questions 
and engaging on these topics that we haven't yet engaged on. The other option, and, and you know, I'm gonna hope Amy can't reach through her computer and hit me, is that we put this off until we've done that research. None of us wanna do that. We would like to move forward the parts of the regulations that we can move forward. So my ask is that we vote to, um, to have it go into effect in two years, knowing that we have a lot of work to do between now and then and committing ourselves to doing that work. Um, I really am uncomfortable with the assumption that someone will be on this council in two years that will say, hey, remember that thing two years ago? We should bring it back up. Um, I would rather have it be, hey, we have this thing kicking in in two years, we really need to discuss it. Hey, we have this thing that's kicking in in a year, we need to look into these regulations and engage on them. So for me, I'm, I'm very uncomfortable just putting it aside and hoping that a, a council in two years has the wherewithal and the desire to revisit this thing that we've done a lot of work on, which provides a more equitable opportunity for folks to not get stuck with these tens of thousands of dollar bills. Um, I think that there are answers to Andy's questions that uh, we should be looking into in, in the over the course of the next two years so that before it kicks in, we know what we're looking at and we can say whether or not it's still a good idea. But to leave it out entirely is relying on hopes and wishes. And while those are beautiful, wonderful things, they're not a solid foundation. Thank you. Shalini. Um, <clears throat> so I was in TSON voted with my um, fellow members in a particular way. But since then, I want to share some of the new information that I am receiving because of which I want to reconsider. Um, and it's more in line, I think it's in between what Anna and Andy is saying, which is actually to rewrite the motion, but I'll come to that later. The new information for me is that we made that decision based on um, the impact that this change would have on the water prices of water for residents, and we were given that chart, and we looked at that and we said, yeah, it's still below our neighboring towns. But what I'm hearing now is that there could be additional costs, which we don't know. And so that's a new piece of information. The second piece of information is that assumption I was making and what I understood was that when the pipe is on, in public property, it is being damaged because of um, uh, work, um, when contractors, utility workers, are digging in. And so it's not the fault of the resident and they are being penalized for that. However, the new information is also there. A lot of these pipes are made out of Orangeburg or and the life expectancy of those pipes is 50 years. So some of these pipes that the you know are going to deteriorate on their own. And so is it the responsibility of the town? It's like saying my roof is old. And so now the town should you know replace it. So, so I mean having the distinction when it is being damaged by you know uh, the town that's clearly should be the responsibility of the town. But when it is naturally deteriorating, should that be the responsibility of the town? I don't believe we engaged in that conversation. Uh, the third thing then is, uh, as Andy also alluded to, is like. I was thinking of only homeowners, but we also have rent, rented uh, spaces and apartments. So are we affording the same um, benefit to landowners and nothing against landowners, but again, landlords, but it is an investment for them, which is very different from a you know, 70, 80 year old woman living in a house who can't afford, it's very different, those two different situations. So did we, I don't remember having a conversation about who is paying what. And uh, the last thing I have also hearing is that the staff is supporting uh, the finance committee's um, conclusions. And so I, but I appreciate what Anna said that we shouldn't just leave it open to, you know, someone will open it up, but could we have a motion that clearly lays out the path that between now and two years, this is what we expect to see happen in terms of, um, you know, what are the what is going to be the cost of, um, you know, the, replacing these old pipes and blah blah blah. So what is specifically make that more specific as a motion? Um, okay. Thank you, Jennifer. Yes. Okay. So I. Um... 
I I'm, would say I'm in Anna's camp. <laughs> um, I, my concern about it being that our pipes are old and so it's the homeowner's responsibility like fixing a roof. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, if there is, if the pipe is broken off the homeowner's property, but between their property and where it me meets the main line, I mean, how many of us can afford to pay for breaking up the street, all the repair work that goes in, in addition to, you know, replacing the pipe and then repaving the street? I mean, I always think of, you know, Dorothy, um, Counsel Counselor Pam had this, you know, have had this happen to her. She was fortunate to have it as part of her homeowner's policy, but it cost $35,000 to repair. And that's just completely not realistic that most any, um, you know, homeowner in Amherst could afford to shoulder that burden. And I had, what I would initially, I think I spoke with uh, Paul about this many months ago when the incident with one of the residents in town who I think had an $18,000 bill. And again, it was for a leak that she didn't even know her pipe was leaking. But there are towns that um, offer their residents buried line coverage. So if something like this happens, you have coverage. And I know after um, Dorothy's um, you know, experience, I tried to get it through our homeowner's policy and they don't offer it. Many policies, it's hard to get. Um, but the towns, there are towns in Massachusetts that provide it, their residents can purchase it through the town. And it wouldn't maybe cover a $35,000 bill, but it would cover, I, you know, if, I think one covers up to 8,000. I mean, anything would be helpful. So I'm, I'm just wanted to ask again is between now and when it's revisited and or implemented in two years, if offering some coverage, so there's some relief we can offer to residents as a possibility. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Dorothy? I always have a hard time finding my little thing. Um, many towns take the responsibility for repairing pipes from the end of the homeowner's property to wherever the main is, and it varies place by place. Um, I agree with Anna. We need a strong motion. The motion that was put forward is just nothing that I would ever uh, put any hope on that somebody would think of it, would remember that then you have to bring everybody up to date. Um, if they wanna do it, you start from ground zero. I also agree with Anna that there's many things going on, but an impetus to do the study, and I agree, there are a lot of things that need to be looked into, is the two year timetable. If you wanna make it three, make it three. But um, so I'm agreeing that we, we, we need to do this. It's just, uh, we need to have a motion which com commits us to this study, whatever it is going to be, that it doesn't say that maybe it's sometime in the future, we'll rethink it, not sure who the we is. And, and I want to remind you that um, we have to do something for the homeowners. The many things go on, but we pay, who's paying taxes in this town? We, as we know, we have a very small commercial base. Most of our taxes are on residences, um, homeowners, and apartments and whatever. That's where the tax base comes from. Many of the people who are very high taxpayers in this town do not have children in the public school system. They pay the school taxes because they believe in the public school system and they don't complain. But I'm saying, what do you have for the homeowners? What do you have to help people so that they don't have to risk losing their home because they can't afford to do this? But if, you, if your sewer pipe breaks, you can't live in a house. OK, it would be declared a public health uh, emergency and the person is up the wall. And we had an older resident who came to us originally with this case. Why do I have to pay, pay for the street, she said. Why? And she had a big bill and it went on. Uh, it was not something that she could do. So it's not that we're trying to do something new. Many, many towns have this coverage and they do it. Uh, towns that have much lower taxes than we have. We pay high taxes and sometimes you need to say, okay, and we have your back. And that's what I see this as being something the town saying, we will not let you get in a deep, deep problem that you can't get out of. So I, I really urge us um, to either support this or if you're going to redo the motion, I it make it a much stronger one, make a commitment that we will carry through and it's not some kind of thing that maybe somebody does if they feel like it in the future at some point, because I think it's a very important thing. It's really to do with, um, you know, equity in this town. 
So thank you. Mandy Joe. Yeah. Um, I don't think I can support, I don't think if we put a motion and, and the motion went through today that there'd be an automatic future service line change that I could vote for the water and sewer regulations with that in there. And so at this point, I'm, I'm going to support a motion that doesn't have the automatic change. Um, I think Shalini and Andy, they have brought up some very good questions that need answered, some equity issues, some cost issues, a lot of stuff that, that we need to know beforehand. I don't know whether two years is long enough. I don't know whether one year is long enough. Um, and with those questions unanswered, I don't think I could vote for regulations that automatically put something like that into effect. Um, because, you know, automatic is great, but if those questions aren't answered, you still have to vote then not to put them into effect, right? And, and the other worry I have is that if we put an automatic into it and we're presented in two weeks or three weeks, whenever it comes out with the automatic effective of this ownership change um, into the regulations that no one will repair for two years. And then because they'll have a financial incentive to wait until the automatic change happens. But then say we choose, the future council chooses not to put the automatic change into effect. Well, we've just made everything more expensive for the homeowners and for the renters who, and, and everyone who has, has done that. And so I think the safest thing to do is to ask the town manager to come back to the council with regulations that don't have a future automatic line ownership change in there, but that when we vote those regulations, we vote um, a request to the town manager to continue presenting our finance and TSO with research on this issue so that it never falls off of our radar. Thank you. Uh, Pam, you've not spoken before. Hi, thanks. Um, I was having difficulty actually understanding that um, if if the water and sewer regs that are being proposed actually include specifically that the ownership um, will change to the property line. So I guess the, the question is, can um, I, I actually think I am I am on the side of not imposing a, a hard deadline for the enactment of the sewer line or the, the service line ownership change until we have some more of the questions answered. Not that I don't support it, but I understand that um, I, I just think it, it looks like there are enough questions that need to be answered. So I didn't want to try to link. I actually would like to look and support the regulations, but I didn't want to necessarily link it to an automatic um, start point. I would I would love to encourage town staff to continue to do the research, perhaps with the uh, the the opportunity for very regular updates or something of that nature, so that it does not fall off the radar. Shalini and Andy, you've both spoken before. Is there anything you feel you need to add to this discussion at this time, Shalini? No, uh, I was just I was just going to ask Paul uh, to answer the question about uh, purchase of insurance because he actually had done research on it. Paul. Yeah, so um, yes, we have done research on it. In my memo, I mentioned that if the town council does not implement for two years, we would certainly go out and seek a program that would allow uh, us to offer that insurance. It would be privately paid by the property owners, but it would be available to every property owner if they chose to purchase it. It does have a limit on the coverage of $8,500. I think that's the last time I spoke to them when we presented this uh, a year ago um, to the council. So we'd, we would refresh that information. But yes, we could offer that program. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take the opportunity to speak because I haven't on this, and that is first and foremost, it is critical that we pass regulations. We have basically gone for years with 
an understanding, but not a written regulation and a bylaw. And so um, I, I fall on the side of make continuing to look at this, but not a date certain. But most importantly, I don't want this to languish in the council any longer. I want us to pass regulations. Um, Shalini, anything else you feel you need to add to this? I do. Um, uh, what I want to add is that, you know, I just want to be clear to the public as well that when we're making the statement that, you know, the that if we do take over, if the town takes over the cost of repair, it means that the town has your back. And if you don't, that means, you know, we are letting people go and having to spend all that money. I think this it's not entirely true because when we say that we are taking over the cost, that cost is going to be spread over the water bill. And what we're really doing is subs and without that clarity, what if we are going to apply this only to homeowners properties or also rented properties and what we are doing is we're subsidizing or we're taking where um, subsidizing la, uh, la, rented properties and their cost and spreading that cost over the water bill of every resident in town. So that's a very important discussion and clarification that needs to happen. Uh, the second thing is I, I think it, I would like us to add to the motion a request to the town manager to do the research over the next two years to make a firm decision how to move forward with this change in an equitable way. And what I mean by that is there are other options like creating, instead of making it available to everyone, having a special fund, because there are many people in this town who are landowners and they can afford it. And, but like creating a special fund, and that's just an, op that's what I'm saying, that we could come up with out of the box options that there is a special fund to pay for homeowners who cannot afford it, but let's not blanket make it for everyone included rented properties at this point. So can someone make a motion to it? it let me just say I'm going to put a motion on the floor and then if there's an amendment, we'll do an amendment. Pam, anything final? Yeah, I think my I didn't state my question very well. Can we separate out the adoption of regulations without having to make the decision today about the ownership issue? Um, that yes, that like is what. Out. Okay, so the following motion I'm going to place on the table. Lynn, sorry, yes. I'm. So, can I answer her question really quickly? Yes. It, it's not really answered in the motion. Um, you, you can't separate them out completely because of the, the way that it trickles out. You need to know whether or not that ownership line um, change is going to be in there. So it's, you can't, we, we talked about this. Amy has to prepare a final set of regulations for us to vote on and needs to know about the ownership change in order to do that. So we can't have like a part A, part B, where one is just the change and one is everything else in the regs because everything else in the regs is kind of impacted by that, is absolutely impacted by that ownership change. So now I is the answer. Thank you, Anna. Um, okay, so the motion is to request the town manager present the town council with water and sewer regulations without an automatic future service line ownership change. Is there a second? Second, Anneke. Okay, Shalini. So I just want to clarify. So if we were, if we want an adopt uh, an edited motion, then we have to say no to this, and then no, no. you have to say I'd like to amend the motion with the following. Oh, I have to have a following. You have to. How do you? How do? You, why don't we try? Why don't we do this? How would you like to amend the motion? What would you like to happen? Let me just pull it in front of me first. So I would like to um, say that with um, with a request to the town manager to do the research uh, needed to, to decide about the future service life's line ownership change in two years or something like that. 
and I'm happy to have people make edits, but that's where I was going with it. Um, okay. So right, the way the motion, I'm sorry, Michelle, you have your hand up. Yeah, I was gonna suggest um, the town manager wrote a memo dated January 9th. Um, and at the bottom of that memo, it says future considerations and it outlines exactly what the town manager um, is hoping to do. And so it may help us to look at that and then include those bullet points as uh, with timelines um, to, to get, to have more clarity in motion if we're going to amend it. Okay. Can I, that Michelle, thank you for drawing our attention to that. And I think that there's a very critical list based on the conversation tonight. There may be even some additions or changes to the list. So here's what I'm going to suggest. Okay. That we deal with a motion that has been put on the table. We not try to amend it tonight. But when the whole set of bylaws and regulations come forward, we then have a well-crafted motion, perhaps including what Michelle just referred to and what Shalini is accomplishing, that asks that the town manager and his staff return to the council in two years, having a direct, with a, answers or responses to the various issues as outlined. So that we, I'm not suggesting we forget that. I'm just suggesting that we finish this conversation tonight. It allows Amy to go back and complete the drafting of the regulations. And then when the regulations and bylaws come back to the council, which is probably gonna be either in the March 6th or the March 20th meeting, that we also then have a well-crafted motion rather than try to draw one up tonight that asks specifically for the town manager to follow up on the following issues and come back to the council in a two-year period. Would that accomplish what you're trying to accomplish, Shalini? Um, if Would that hold weight with the next council? To yeah have a separate okay absolutely absolutely kathy well i you said what i was going to say lynn i just want to separate them i want to vote this mm -hmm. and then we can come back and have a very separate set of instructions but but get the regulations out um you know and and i realize that there uh, there are people who want to put a separate clause so we have to take a vote on this that you've put on the table and then um, if it gets voted down, we've got an alternative wording on it. Um, so, Correct. Okay. Okay. Jennifer? Um, can we get the buried line coverage somewhere in that? So we feel like we can provide people, I mean, they would still have to purchase it, the coverage, but that's part of the package. Um, I just... think, again, when we come back with the final regulations would be the time to have a motion rega regarding that. So in other words, that the, the motion would be to, you know, ask the town manager to engage or provide a package that he has already investigated. And we can have that as yet another motion at that time. Again, remembering we're not adopting the regulations tonight. We're just trying to deal with this one piece. Okay, thank you. Okay, but now, I'm now hearing the need for two additional motions on the nights that we do that. Dorothy? Okay, so uh, this is where I get confused. We have a TSO motion. We have a finance committee motion. When you talk about voting and then clarifying, are you suggesting voting the TSO motion, which includes this aim? although it's not clear, or are you saying you're suggesting that we vote that down and we vote for the finance motion. Okay. And then somehow we're going to come later, some other stuff is going to come. So I just need to know which motion you, you think we're going to vote on first. Thank you. Um, 
the motion that I made is not the TSO motion. It's in fact, the finance committee motion. Okay. The motion I made was to request the town manager present the town council with water and sewer regulations without an automatic future service line ownership change. Okay. During mm -hmm. that conversation, there have been two other suggested motions. One is further study on some issues that have been outlined in the memo of January 9th, and maybe even some other ones added to that. The second one is that there, in fact, we go ahead and have the town engage in ability to offer through a third party an insurance capability, okay? And I'm suggesting that those two motions would come forward at the time we adopt the regulations so that we not sit here tonight and try to make up motions that would be better done in a thoughtful craft crafting way and that we do all of that at the time we adopt the regulations. Um, can I make one quick comment? Mm -hmm. Please. The amount of insurance that um, Jennifer is suggesting would not cover any of the pipe. The cost of repairing your own lawn, the damage to your own property, which is what your responsibility would come to more than that $7,000. So the cost of repairing the pipe under the public street, under the public sidewalk would still be completely uncovered. Um, but I'm gonna leave it to Anna to see what she says. Thank you. Anna. Gosh, Dorothy, that's terrifying. Um, it's, so, I'm I'm not supporting this for the reasons I've already said, and I won't say them all again, but I think it's really important for everybody to just take a minute to remember we're not actually voting on the regulations right now. We're, we're voting on which version of the rec regulations we want to vote on, um, which is a little confusing. I will support whichever version of the regulations come forward, but I want to see one, and I believe what is the right move for our town and to demonstrate to our residents that we are we are showing up, and you know, Shani, I, I disagree with your assertion that um, that this is is not saying that. I think that you know, for us to say, yeah, we'll 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 study it, you know, um, is is disingenuous to demonstrating the care and the the change that needs to happen. So for me, the right version of the regulations I would like to see has this going automatically into effect, still gives us all of the things that we've been talking about in terms of time to study, time to adjust, and time to, to continue to move that deadline as needed if we decide to do that. Um, that's the version of the regulations I would like to see come forward, not one that just ignores it completely and hopes we bring it back up again, despite any um, well-intentioned motions otherwise. Thank you. Okay. So, the motion on the table is the following. If you support that motion, okay, it is to request the town manager present the town council with water and sewer regulations without an automatic future service line ownership change. If you vote for that, that is how the regulations will come back. If you vote against that, then and, and if this fails, then we'll bring up the other motion, which is a motion that the ownership lines would ch change on July 1, 2025. Okay. Is there a question? I want to be very clear. Shalini? So just to be clear that what will come up then in March will be um, the, the regulations with with the additional language that we've been discussing. So it won't just be that with an automatic, uh, no, without an automatic future service, it will have the language for uh, research and- No, the, those, the research language and the insurance language would be dealt with as separate motions at the same time. Hmm. So when you adopt the bylaws and the regulations, that's mm -hmm. one set of motions. Right. The next set of motions would be, and we you know, further ask the town manager to research the following and report back to the town council by such and such a date. Okay. 
And then the third motion would be, we ask the town manager to um, move forward on implementing a optional insurance par uh, policy with third party that individuals res residents can um, opt into. Okay, so can I raise another concern then that yes. my concern with doing something like this is what Anna is saying that it will just get lost and um, but my concern in promising that we are going to um, have an automatic future service line change is that in case the research shows that the cost of absorbing the cost for rented properties damage is so large that we can't do it that i mean that's not being resolved um right now the properties whether it's just homeowner home owner occupied versus rented and and the cost of that can be huge for replacing all of those pipes that are so aged. And so at that point, when we say that, no, we can't do it, there's gonna be such a pressure at that point to go back on. So that sounds disingenuous too, to say that, oh, we will, we will have an opportunity to change at that point. You always have an opportunity to change. And you, in fact, you always have an opportunity to walk it back entirely. But it, the goal tonight is to decide whether or not we want to change the property line ownership up to the property line in two years or leave it open-ended but then have other motions later on in March when we do this that deal with what other questions do we want to answer it and when and insurance. My, my question is just that why can't we attach that to the motion that we are adopting this, these red set of resolutions with this set of conditions? If we do that, it would be better to do that when we do the adoption yeah. of the bylaw and the- Yes. Uh, we down, it, it, let me just say, it's much cleaner to just adopt a bylaw and regulations. And then if you have other things you want done, you want to put those in other motions. They can refer back to the bylaw and the regulations that you've adopted. If anybody other has a different opinion, please speak up. I've, always, I, I've, is, I've been led to believe that it is important to, to adopt cleanly a regulation and a bylaw. And then if you want other things done, do that as separate motions. Okay, I wait to hear other people speak first. Dorothy? I just want to say that my support of Centennial is linked to this. With Centennial, we agree to take on a huge, huge cost because it's something that we need to do. It's right to plan for something that we may not need at this exact moment, but we know that if we don't do it, we will lose an opportunity and we won't necessarily, we might not be able to do it later and we might not have the water that we need. So if we're willing to spend big bucks to do that, which will be slowly repaid through water rates, I think it also means that we should be willing to do something a bit, a little bit here and there. Um, as it comes about. They're not all gonna go fall apart at the same time. It will actually give the town uh, a little more control over the quality of, of, of work and materials. I see the two of them is going together. So, I mean, nobody seemed to have a big problem voting for Centennial. And yet when it comes to something that might do individuals, there's a problem. And I've got to tell you when, you, when you talk about, oh, let's have a fund for people who can't afford it. That's like the fund at school. All the kids who can't afford the school trip come and we'll give you a free ticket. No, the kids don't go. Parents don't let their kids sign up. And how many people do I know who might actually have very little money are going to say, oh, I'm so poor. I want to get it from the special fund. They will always feel, well, maybe I don't, uh, somebody else is poorer than me. So we do the big things. And I think we also do the piecemeal thing. So I think we should support the TSO motion tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Pam. 
I appreciate I appreciate hearing from everyone. It, it definitely is a nuanced situation. Um, I we often have uh, comments from staff, and I, I feel guilty that I haven't been to all the TSO meetings or all the FinCom meetings to hear the ins and outs of this conversation. I would appreciate hearing some feedback, at least from the from the town staff. Thank you. Guilford, do you have your hand up? Yes, I'm waiting for a reply. From someone else. Yeah, because I'm making sure I'd say the right thing. Okay, Amy, are you giving him the reply? <laughs> so the, the regulations you have now are written a certain way. Um, and what you're being asked to do The way they're written now is the town will take over ownership of the, of the service lines right now. So if you want us to wait two years and whether we study it or we don't study it or whether it's automatic or it's not automatic, we have to change the regulations. The question before you is, do we change it for two years or do you just take what is written now, which says, the town will take over the water regulations upon approval. That's the water services upon approval. That's really what you're being asked. Um, we can talk later about whether you want the mandatory two-year review or anything else. But before you get the regulations, if you don't want the town to take over the services now, we have to change the regulations so you have the correct regulations to vote on next. Does that make sense what I just said? I think I just confused. It doesn't, it doesn't. Um I'm the two chain the two options that are before the council come out of finance committee. Finance committee basically said we don't want ownership to change automatically in two years. The uh right so, the information that came out of TSO was we want it to change automatically in two years. Amy, please raise your you go ahead. So yeah. No, all I was going to say, just to kind of clarify what Guilford's saying is because of the initial conversations with TSO, we rewrote these whole regs for ownership to take place immediately. So we're going to need to change with both of the recommendations with TSO and FinCom. We're going to have to do some change to the regulations. Really, you know, I, I agree with you, Lynn, that the most important thing is that we move these forward and we just need to know what change we're going to bake into these because right now we've got two different committees that are recommending different things and so um we want to ultimately put forward something that has the the best chance at succeeding when we bring it back and, and rea reality you could not you could take a third option and say you want to accept what's written now and do it immediately recommendations are this that recommendations so we just need to know how to write the rules so you can approve them. Okay. Um, Michelle, you had your hand up and then you put it down. I wanna make sure you have an opportunity to speak. I think I, I just was confused by what Guilford said. So the regulations as they stand right now, um, leave it to the homeowner the proposed regulations based on the TSO's initial conversation was to shift that. So the question is something has to be re rewritten either way, right? And it's whether to have an automatic two year or to not include that and then have something that's distinct from that, that gives a work plan to the town manager to evaluate over the next however much time the council decides. Is that? Michelle, I, you, I think you have some of it, but let me, it's initially in the conversations in finance and then in TSO, there was a strong sense of needing to move and do this right away, okay? To change the ownership from the main line to the property line that presently is covered by the individual's home or the property, to have that now be taken over by the town. And then Amy, with all of the recommendations and work that's been done, and I wanna recognize Anna's enormous work on this as well. 
went and drew up regulations that right now the draft says that we will effective July 1 take over the ownership of the of the main line to the ta- to the property owner that the town will take over that ownership that's the way the draft presently is written based on some of the various things that people have discussed tonight TSO said nah let's implement it in 2 years okay finance said you know maybe we don't want to have the ownership in there at all, change in ownership in there at all. Instead, leave it go. But, you know, as we've heard tonight, come back in two years for reconsideration. So that's where we are. I, I'm wanna, I'm going to try to do this by motion. Shalini? Question. I have a question for Amy and Guilford. So in the current, after all the changes you've made based on TSO's discussions, um, would the uh, would this include the apartment buildings, rented homes, as well as owner occupied homes? And do you no. the second question is, do you support because the Finance Committee report said that the staff supported not tying us down to this, but allowing the time to study and then deciding. But so I don't know which staff they were referring to. So I'm directing that question to you. Do you support us locking in to um, what we have right now? Or would you prefer the space to uh, study this in two years? And um, yeah, so what is, yeah, two questions. So your first question is yes and no. And it's harder to, it's harder to explain than what you just said. We have private water lines that are considered services um, that are quite large and quite big. UMass, all the water lines on UMass property, which was not discussed, are private. And they pay the same rate as everybody else. All the water lines on Amherst College are private. All the water lines on Hampshire College are private. Most of the large, most of the large apartment complexes, the water lines on those properties are private. Yeah. So these are the mains and these are the little lines that go to the buildings as well. There are a number of smaller rental properties <clears throat> that are treated just like single family houses. Their service goes from the property all the way to the, I mean, from the house all the way to the main. So it's, it's, it's a bigger question than you actually identified if you actually want to start looking at that. And we kind of pointed it out that there's a lot of private stuff around town. Um, Amity Place is a private condominium association. They own the water line once it leaves the main on Amity Street all the way to the complex. The Hollows, um, which I don't know if that's the right name for it. I think so. there's another name. The Hollows and Pine wood right they are private subdivisions they own the water line from the time it leaves old farm road until it wraps back through the neighborhood and comes back to old farm road mm -hmm. so there's there's different degrees of private and they apply to apartment complexes and condos they also apply to our public and private institutions so the question is much bigger than you've talked about and discussed here the second part of your question is um, we have no real preference. Taking two years to study this will answer a lot more of these questions. And yes, there are a lot of questions, um, but we just need to know the regulation that you're gonna vote because we need to put some regulations in effect. Is the ownership gonna be, the, the property owner maintains ownership for two years and then we make another decision in two years if the town takes it over at the property line or if it stays the way it is. That's really what we're kind of how we're doing this. Okay. Shalini, does that answer your question? Mostly. Thank you. Anna. Thank you. Uh, I have a, a little bit of a bone to pick with the way that you keep framing this, Lynn, because the way that you keep framing the finance committee recommendation mm -hmm. is that nothing changes, but that we study it. And that's not part of the motion. 
The motion is just to say that nothing changes about ownership. If we decide that that's going to happen, the studying is going to happen, then that's a different thing that will be, not be addressed through this at this meeting. So I just want to be very clear that that is not an automatic part of that motion. That is correct. However, it can be a motion on the evening when we do the first and second readings of the bylaws. Yes, but until we voted it, I don't think it's appropriate to tie it to this motion. That's fine. Michelle. Um, do we have other regulations or bylaws that automatically adopt something in some timeline? Um, or would this be a unique situation to include an automatic adoption? I just, I can't recall seeing any that have that, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. And to me, a regulation um, is not like a living document in the sense that, you know, it is, but it's, it's like you adopt it. And I, I don't, I just, I'm not familiar with other regulations in which we would have, have that kind of automatic adoption of something in a certain time period. Paul or anybody else. My recollection is that usually when you adopt regulations, they're effective either immediately or very soon after that. But I, I think it's a good question, Michelle. I think I think you're right. Is that typically they have a time time span which they become implemented ninety days immediately, whatever it is. Yeah. Right. Mandy Joe, you had your hand up. I was just going to say the same thing that typically you have an effective date, and it's not half half is effective one day and half is effective a different day. It's just an effective date. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the motion on the table is to request the town manager present the town council with water and sewer regulations without an automatic future service line ownership change. It does not refer to research. It does not refer to insurance. It refers to what the regulations will say when they come back to us. Is there any further question? Okay, then we're going to, I don't even know where we're starting. I think we're up to Pam Rooney. I think I understand and I think I'm going to vote yes. <laughs> Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. I'm going to abstain because I'm still confused. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Alicia Walker. Abstain. Shalini Bone Milne. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. No. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. I, I, uh, I'm going to abstain out of need for more time. Thank you. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. No. Eight in favor, two opposed, and three abstentions. That's what I have. Okay. Um, let me just check one thing. Let's try to do the uh, proposed snow and ice so that when we break um Guilford and Amy don't have to stick around any longer so this is a first reading uh I'm going to call on uh GOL since this originated in GOL and Pat do you want to speak to this or have someone else from the committee speak to it um I think that I can speak, and I'd like Mandy Joe to chime in if I miss something. Uh, we looked at this 
uh, bylaw came to us from the bylaw review committee four years ago and was one of the things that we were looking at. I think you can see in the um, revisions that are in the bylaw now are in your packet, and I think they're quite clear. Um, we have expanded this beyond snow and ice to look at other obstructions of a public way, which can be trash, leaves, tree limbs, things like that. Um, and again, I'm going to say that those things seem quite clear. We have had one uh, request, which came in very late from the tree warden, uh, so it is not in the packet. And the tree warden is very concerned that could someone could use the language of the bylaw as it's written now to remove a shade tree without approval. So um, he is suggesting uh, a change and a creation of a B3, uh, which would say something like the tree warden shall assess public shade trees impacting public ways and sidewalks before they are trimmed or removed. So that uh, is the one thing that is not here yet. And Athena, do you need me to read that again? Athena? I, I don't believe so. Athena and I discussed that requested change earlier today, and we um, it can be added in when this comes back for second reading. Great. Okay. There I, is I do have that language. Um, and there was also one other small change um, for inspectional services that should be inspection oh. services. Yes. And, yeah. and I'm trying to understand whether we need to add, therefore, the tree warden up in the uh, enforcement. But as you say, that can come back on a second reading. So I guess I could, Mandy, unless there's something you specifically want to add, I think we can open this to questions. You covered it, Pep. Kathy? Oh, sorry, Lynn. Go ahead. Sorry. No, go right ahead, <laughs> Kathy. <laughs> um, my question is 24 hours. Um, I, you know, I have no, I'm fine with what's being proposed, but if, as I understand what, this would get triggered, and let me just think of a, a tree limb, for example, you know, as opposed to shovel the snow off your walk. Um, if there is a large or a few up here there, if you ride your bike, you realize you're being scratched by large bushes. It's not a tree. 24 hours seems like a short time period. So it's just purely a question on 24. You know, it 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 because if you don't do it in 24 hours, then you face a fine. So I, I'm just looking for where 24 hours came from. And when you've added to obstructions is when I perked up started looking at the 24 hours. It wasn't so much ice and snow. Um, so, so I presume that it gets triggered by someone complains that there is an obstruction. So as opposed to there's uh, obstruction police running around town. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna have council volunteers running around like, doing this. Oh, I'm getting <laughs> knocked around here. So, so it's just, it's a question on 24 um, purely. Are you saying I that's... don't have a suggestion like would 36 be better okay. or would be 40? I'll record it as a question for us to go back and look at on uh, Wednesday at GOL. Any other questions? Andy? Oh, Lynn, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, please go right ahead. Okay, Andy. <laughs> so I guess I have a couple of observations and I'm not sure how they are really fairly dealt with. One is that uh, sidewalks aren't really universal throughout the town and how they are, whether they exist or how they are uh, arranged. There are some subdivisions, including my own, where uh, when the subdivision was built, a sidewalk was put in that nobody is really maintaining. Uh, certainly the town is not maintaining, and it only grinds like one side of one of one section of houses. And um, so it's really, in some ways, a, uh, a sidewalk to nowhere. And then the other thing that I've, that is that there's some sidewalks 
that the town is plowing uh, because they've been determined to be of such significance that uh, that that's a decision that uh, DPW has made and has used a sidewalk plow to plow them, and that doesn't occur everywhere. So I, I think that the uh, thing that concerns me about this, and I'd like to um, hear more conversation as we go along, um, is aren't these inequities that, um, and what do we, how are we addressing those inequities? Yeah, and I'm going to pass this to Amy and Guilford because I feel like uh, what I understand is there have been sidewalks that the town has been clearing, but they don't belong to the town, but it, it was easy for them to do. So there's a lot of confusion by residents. So could you address that, either one of you? Uh, yes. So the bylaw says that town pro the property owner is responsible for the sidewalk in front of their property. Um, and back 20, 19, 20 years ago, um, they wanted to kind of improve the service and give a little more service by having the town sidewalk plow, which went by some areas, just go ahead and stay on the sidewalk. Um, plow these areas um, as they went to the areas the town owns, and that's kind of how this started. Um, and then people said, well, this is an important sidewalk, and it connects this town property to this town property, so that sidewalk got added, and then this sidewalk got added, and, and really it kind of it kind of morphed and changed the bylaw negatively. I mean, the bylaw, some people don't think it exists, and that it's not that they're not responsible and the town's just responsible. So that's kind of what happened here. Um, so that's how we got that list of sidewalks that we end up doing. And we really are only supposed to go through once and not go back again. And sometimes we don't even go through once if we don't plow. So it's kind of, that's how that came about. Amy, did you want to add something? Thank you, Gilbert. Yeah, no, Guilford kind of covered it. I guess I just kind of wanted to reiterate the point that we certainly, you know, took on as a courtesy pass, one courtesy pass, certain, you know, certain sidewalks that led to a town property were going by there anyway. And really what's happened over time is people have seen that as the obligation shift to the town. So now, you know, unfortunately, it's just gotten confused in a lot of people's minds. And now they kind of approach us with, you know, my sidewalk hasn't been done, not realizing that it's their obligation to get done and that we do a courtesy pass, but that doesn't remove their obligation at all to do it. So thank you. Um, Lynn, you want me to continue? <laughs> I'll go ahead. Mandy Joe. Thank you. I it gave me a chance to catch up on some notes for future meetings. Mandy Joe. Yeah. Um a couple of other things that we might want to add that um, a constituent had brought up who's been following this um, and we forgot to talk about at the last GOL meeting, which one of them is exactly what Kathy said for section A or B2, the clearing of debris, extending the time from 24 hours to maybe 72 hours or a week, a little bit longer, which is different than snow and ice. There are two different sections, right? Um, when I drafted it, I just basically copied section B1 into B2 and changed snow and ice to something else. Um, so that's where 24 came from, Kathy. It's just copying the paragraph. Um, so I would support adding a longer time for those types of obstructions. And then the other thing for B1 was a concern that people do their sidewalks, but not the curb cuts, um, that they don't see the curb cut as part of the sidewalk. And so potentially adding into section B1 in particular, that curb cuts are part of the sidewalk obligation. Um, so. So are you suggesting, Mandy Jo, that perhaps um, this should, GOL should discuss this, bring back a second, on a second reading, a few changes, and maybe that second yeah. reading won't happen until March 20th. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Or or if we read it on the 6th and GOL doesn't have time, um, we can just amend at that time, but it might be easier for GOL to bring them back. Yeah. 
I would prefer that GOL look at it again and bring it back. Are there other suggestions, Pam? Yes, thank you. Uh, similar to what Mandy Jo just said, um, perhaps the time frame is specified by the, I'll call it the officer in charge, whoever it was that, that um, <clears throat> provides the notice to that property owner, they can work out something just like they do with, with um, correcting issues in rental properties during an inspection. They, they specify the time frame by when it has to get done. Clearly, if it's something that's block, blocking traffic or forcing people out into a street, it needs to get clean, cleaned up pretty quickly. Um, but that's perhaps another opportunity to put the time frame in without specifying it too closely. Okay. Dorothy, a um, couple of the suggestions about time frame. In terms of greenery, uh, I was asked to um, speak to some neighbors about greenery, and they said they've been waiting for three weeks already trying to get somebody to come and do it, and they were bushes that were too tall for them to do. I mean, you can be say, yes, yes, I'm going to do it, and not be able to get the help or be able to you know climb up on that ladder. Um, about the snow and ice, we spent a lot of time thinking about that because this came out just as we were uh, having a little snow and ice storm, and our service that we had didn't come. And so my husband was out there doing things he's not supposed to do. Um, but we have to renegotiate now with the service. They said, oh, we don't come to do the sidewalks when it's less than something or other. So in other words, there's a bit of discussion that has to be take place between people <laughs> who do the service that people hire that needs to mesh with the rulings. And you know, I, I can't say what that should be now, but on Amity Street on a hill, we have to get our sidewalk shoveled. It's too important, it's major, and it's really hard to walk up going on a hill. So I, the 24 hours thing to me is too long. Um, I think that people should try to get their sidewalk done uh, certainly 12 hours. The fine maybe doesn't happen until 24, but the way it's written, it sounds like it's okay if you don't do it until 24. And you know, so Bob was out there in the dark and it was done way before 24 hours, but it was way too long for anyone who's trying to walk up that street on an icy day. So I, I think that we need um, some more specifics about this. You know, when is it, when should it be shoveled and when does the fine start? And um, maybe some, some indications of, of some of the language that people that do this kind of shoveling uh, think of. Um, and there's, you know, this question of shovel, salting, uh, ice-free, snow-free. I mean, there's a lot of variables here. Um, and it's very serious. I remember living in Hartford, Connecticut. I was a little girl. Policeman rang our doorbell at 7, 6.30 in the morning. And he said to my father, who had, was just getting ready to go to work, your sidewalk's not done because we lived in a big place. And so he said to us, kids, go clean the sidewalk. The policeman got upset. He said, I didn't expect your children to do it. And he said, well, who else is going to do it? I have to go to work. Uh, and of course, we did. We shoveled those sidewalks. Didn't matter if we were eight years old or whatever. But we knew we had to do it. Because when a policeman comes to your door, it's pretty clear you got to shovel your sidewalk. So I am for spending a little more time with the committee to spend a little more time on these rules because they're very, very important. But there are many distinctions, I think, in it as to when you should try to get your sidewalk cleared, to what level, and when the fine comes in. Because I don't think they should, you should, I think 24 hours might make some people think I don't have to do it for 24 hours. And that's not what the, the new legislation should be saying, I think. Paul, you have your hand up. Yeah, so I just think one might, as, as we're going to be making minor clarifications under Section B2, it says um, within 24 hours of receiving a no, notice to remedy, and I would suggest that we have that be notice to remedy from the town. So it can't be a neighbor notifying you saying you've had, I've notified you 24 hours ago. It should be an official thing that the town issues a notice. Okay, thank you. Uh, Guilford, you had your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, when we have um, brush our tree complaints of hanging over the sidewalk, we usually send a letter and it's five days from the date of receive the letter that you contact us and tell us what your solution is. And if your solution, um, if your solution is such that you have to bring a, a contractor in and the contractor tells you, well, I can't come in until a certain time, that's your solution. And we normally accept that for brush and stuff like that. So if you wanted to try to work something like that. And that's how we do it now if someone complains. 
Uh, Gilbert, I'm going to ask. Sorry, I know I'm interrupting. No, go ahead. Can you yeah. put that in an email for me, or send the send what you have that you use? That would yes, be helpful. Yes, we can do that. Please okay. do it tomorrow. Yes. So we we've heard several <laughs> suggestions uh, for GOL to look at before they come back with a second reading. Uh, are there any other comments on this at this time? Okay, seeing none, um, Guilford and Amy, thank you okay. so much for being here uh, for this long and involved multi-tiered conversation about everything from sewer, water, ice, bushes, um, sewer plants, everything. Thank you so much. And for the council, we're going to take a break. We're going to reconvene at 920 Please turn off your mic and your picture. Turn your picture back on when you come back. Um, excuse me. Will we be um, Will we be doing the poll petition tonight? Hi, Mike. I, I emailed you to let you know that it was voted earlier in the meeting. Okay. So it, it, okay. Hello. So it I'm was on, approved. It was approved. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Can you walk Molly, honey? Hello.
Please turn your picture back on when you return. Please turn your picture on when you return so I know you're here. Uh, Michelle, I know, is back. And Alicia, are you back? Yes, I am. Thank you. Thank you. Andy and Shalini? Athena, when we start, uh, could you put the um, motion for the Special Act extending voting rights to lawful permanent residents up on the screen, please? Okay, um, so we are going to move on to the Special Act extending voting rights to lawful permanent residents. Uh, the motion is on your screen. I'm going. I'm going to only read the part that's the beginning. I'm not going to read the full act, and seek a second. And this is to approve the proposed special act set forward below, an act extending voting rights to lawful permanent residents, and to petition the general court for special legislation, provided, however, that the general court may make clerical or edit editorial changes of form only to the bill unless. The town council approves amendments to the bill before enacted by the general court. And then it's stated. Is there a second? Second, DeAngelis. Okay. The motion's been made and second. Are there questions or comments? Okay. I, so, I just would like to say one small thing. Yep, yeah, please, Pat. Um, and I promised a friend that I would... Um, use this quote by Cesar Chavez. Uh, Chavez. Um, what he said when they were fighting for rights, uh, voting rights, we don't need perfect political systems. We need perfect particip participation. And this uh, allowing um, legal permanent residents to be able to vote and run for office and uh, in the town of Amherst it creates that kind of perfect participation. We, a part of that perfect participation, we could go further, but let's begin here. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to start with Kathy Shane. 
Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub is now absent. Uh, Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Balmill. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Nika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. And Pam Rooney. Yeah. It's unanimous with one absent. Uh, the next item is authorization of town council president to sign a letter in support of the protecting community television television act. And Andy, you asked this to be remo removed from consent. And would you like to speak to that at this time? Yes, it really isn't that I'm opposed to um, sending a letter, but I was a little bit um, taken aback by the um, lack of information that we've received regarding what the legislation is that we're supporting. Uh, having worked in the uh, whole area of the, our various cable bids and contracts in the last round, uh, I uh, understand exactly what the problems is that Amherst Media is having with fi financing their operations under the current arrangement. But um, I felt really um, strange by not knowing. And is there any information that anybody could provide that explains what it is that the Markey Bill proposes to do? Anna? Sure. So I had included a memo in the packet that I thought, I hoped would clearly, excuse me, clearly outline what the bill does. Um, so I'm not sure if you had a chance to to read that, Andy, but um, essentially it's it's a very small bill, but it, it has a big impact. So um, I'm going to just read from my memo really quickly. Uh, it specifies the definition of franchise fee to read the term franchise fee means any tax fee or other monetary assessment of any kind. Um, and it used to say that it includes any tax fee or other monetary assessment. So it's kind of locking in those, those parameters um, and, and that it adds in the words other monetary. So that's kind of what ties in the other element of the, um, the franchise fee. So I, I don't know if I can answer any other questions questions, but basically it's it's sort of locking in that definition so that the um, in-kind contributions are counted as uh, counting towards that franchise, or sorry, um, the, the in-kind contributions, excuse me, are, um, are included in that. Does that help at all, Andy? I guess I'm not sure what the in-kind contributions are and so sure so those are um, in-kind contributions include the money that it costs the cable company to um to offer things like amherst media uh, to offer the public educational and government um channels and so the the communications act of 1934 established a five percent franchise fee cap basically limiting the fees that cable companies can pay as 5% of their gross revenue. Um, and then franchise fees are then, they go back to communities oftentimes, local governments can use them to maintain, for example, right of ways used by cable companies. Um, and so by considering the hosting of those channels as an in-kind donation, cable companies are able to take the cost of offering those services and count them towards the 5% fee cap. Um, because of this, there's a significant drop in the actual franchise fees. So it leads to a drop in revenue, a drop in resources for channels like Amherst Media and other public uh, governmental, public educational governmental, excuse me, um, channels. So it's, it's trying to make it so that they are not able to sort of use the, the money that they're spending doing something they're required to do to pay less in, in fees to communities. I guess that uh, this is what my thought is. I'll be real quick. 
so because I don't want to spend any more time on it, but uh, I think that one of the biggest problems that Amherst Media and other providers, it's not just them, have faced is that so many people are cutting their services uh, to uh, cable because they're using the internet to obtain television programming that they like and that uh, because Comcast is not responsible or any you know, cable provider center uh, doesn't have to pay on the portion of the bill that has to do with providing internet services and the other internet service providers aren't taxed um, that it's created this tremendous decline in the portion of the bill that is chargeable and uh, you know I, I just still haven't quite heard the words that um, get there and I and I certainly support what Senator Markey is doing and uh, would feel uh, uh, adding a little bit saying and taking any other steps that would um, enhance the revenue to local cable providers by expanding what um, is uh, taxed or something like that would have been better, but I don't want to prolong the conversation or amend the letter. So uh, I'm going to drop it at that. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. I, I just want to note there is um, state legislation that would that I believe, and I'm, I'm a little a little less familiar with it right this second, but I believe seeks to include streaming services in some way. Um, and so that would be something else that we could look into supporting as well as a council. There is such legislation. Uh, Mandy Jo? Uh, you guys just covered it with this legislation. The MMA is supporting that legislation. Okay. That should... um, are there any other questions or comments on this? Then moving to a vote, I'm going to start with Andy Stein. I don't think we had a motion or second Oh, I'm yet. sorry, you're right, we didn't. Uh, to authorize the council president to sign a letter in support of the Protecting Community Television Act S340. Is there a second? Second, Dr. Okay. Mather. Um, now we're going to move to the vote. Um, Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub is absent. Lucia Walker. Yes. Shalini Balmilne. Yes. Uh, Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Goth here. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Nika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Uh, Pam Rooney. I mean, sorry, Dorothy Pam first. Yes. Yes. Then Pam, Pam. Rooney. Then yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. It's unanimous with one absent. Um, we did the um, rules of procedure. And so we're going to move to the proposal for an increase to counselor stipends and childcare costs. It also includes a look at health insurance benefits. I'm going to make the motion. I will mention that this already, I'm sorry, the motion was a motion to refer and that motion passed in the consent agenda. But I do want to note that the motion should have read uh, to refer the proposal for increase to counselor stipends, family care reimbursement, and health insurance benefits to the Finance Committee for review and recommendation with report to the council by April 1, 2023. That motion would be consistent with the um, actual memo that we received from Councillors Miller and Walker. Michelle or Alicia, would you like to speak to um, your proposal? Sure. Um, I'll just briefly go over it since there is a memo in the packet. Um, and then I think Alicia also would like to speak to it. 
Um, so it's three parts. Um, there's uh, part one is to increase the counselor salary to 10,000. It's 5,000 annually um, currently. Um, this also includes uh, for the council president to receive a bonus stipend of $2,500 annually, which is already the case now. And then in, in addition, that is not um, the, the current case is that committee chairs would receive a bonus stipend of $500 annually for chairing a committee. Um, the family care reimbursement is that uh, counselors would be in, reimbursed up to a certain dollar amount in the um, proposal. We have $16.25 per hour, and that was based on some um, data from care.com uh, with respect to our, um, our area. And uh, that would cover any family-related um, care uh, that would happen during council meetings, committee meetings, as well as um, up to five hours per week for council-related work and activities. And then also to develop a reimbursement policy that is straightforward and timely. Part three includes um, exploring the possibility of offering health insurance benefits to counselors, um, and this would be an exploration by the finance committee as well as through the town manager in terms of what the administrative aspects of that would be. Um, just a quick background, the, the charter establishes two sections um, that speak to counselor compensation. The first is uh, how counselor compensation can be changed either to increase or decrease it. Um, and that has to happen uh, by a majority vote of the full town council during the fir first 18 months of the town councilor's term. Um, and then the section, second section, section 10.7R, outlines um, the actual compensation that councilors receive. Uh, the reason for the proposal <clears throat> is twofold. Um, first, to increase diversity, um, as Martha Hanner spoke to earlier from the League, and we really appreciate the support of, of the League of Women Voters on this proposal, um, as well as others who have written in support. Um, and uh, I think we know that representation matters and uh, that it takes a lot of time for uh, us to do this work, and that's time that we're um, giving up for something else um, that that we may want to be doing or need to be doing. And then also um, against a benchmark of 10 other communities in the state, Amherst ranks lowest. Again, you can look in the memo if, if, if in the public if you're interested in looking at other communities. Um, Amherst ranks the lowest in terms of compensation. So while we don't think this fully uh, compensates counselors um, for the energy, both physically, mentally, emotionally, um, that is spent as a counselor, we do believe this is a good starting point. Um, and we'd also like to add a rule in the rules of procedure that ask um, for the council to review compensation at the 15 month mark of each two year council term. And I think Alicia is gonna uh, take it from there. Alicia. Yes, thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I don't have too much to add uh, because I know Michelle went over everything and you all had um, hopefully a chance to review this in your packet. Um, but I just wanted to speak to this a little bit more personally um, because, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to become um, a town counselor was to be able to figure out ways to make running for public office more accessible to more diverse people. Um, and one of the largest, most apparent barriers um, has been equitable compensation for the time um, that is spent on the work and being in the meetings. Um, and then for me, um, as a young single parent, um, being able to find reliable child care for meetings that are so long um, and so late in the night and having that not be an additional burden on those who choose to participate um, we wanted to make sure that that was all encompassing. And so um, including the language on family uh, member care, whether that be a child or any other family member who needs to be cared for and might incur extra expenses um, in order for someone to be able to participate in public 
government. Um, like Michelle said, surrounding communities with comparable population sizes are all compensated. Their counselors are all compensated at a higher rate. Um, and many of those councils don't require their counselors to serve on additional committees, uh, which accrues additional time and additional work requirements. Um, so I think that this is a very reasonable offer. I don't even think that this um, nearly adequately compensates counselors enough for the amount of work and time um, that is committed to be able to be present and participating in public office. However, I think this is a great start and it at least places us to the next lowest uh, community in line with the next lowest compensated community for counselor stipends in the area. Um, I'm now looking for counselor comments, Dorothy. Um, I just want to congratulate um, them both on such a thorough job. Um, I didn't know they were working on it. I know that people have talked to me about this and we've uh, felt the need um, to do this, to be fair, um, and yet hadn't, had, hadn't done it. And yet so many of the needed things are there. I want to comment on the health insurance, um, at least with the way I see it now. Most people would not need it, but those that do should have it. And they'd be able to, I assume, join in with the town's uh, rates, which would be uh, much better than an individual trying to get health insurance on their own. So um, I just want to say I strongly support this. People have spoken to me about this. We want to have younger people. We want to have people with children. Uh, it's our investment in the future. And, and, and it's not just children that you might need care for. My mother, when she was taking care of her mother, who was quite old, had to hire a nana sitter in order to leave the house. I mean, sometimes... People have to do these things and it adds up. It also, I think, would kind of reduce strife between couples um, in that when somebody says you're spending all your time on town council, they can at least say, well, at least I'm making something. I'm bringing in something because right now, um, most people, when they talk to me about uh, the job, see it as too hard, too hard, too challenging, too time consuming. Um, and that just you have to give up too much. So I think we have to really make this outreach in order to make the job more equitable and make it so that it's, of course, it th these funds that she's mentioning don't in any way reimburse one for the real time, but they help, they help. And I think it would be appreciated and we might actually encourage some people that we would love to have run for council to do so in the future. So I, I totally support this. Thank you, Shalini. Yeah, I also want to firstly thank Michelle and Alicia for a very thoughtful and much needed uh, attention to this issue. Um, and I had not even thought of the community chairs, committee chairs. I think that's totally deserving. It is uh, a lot of work. Completely agree with that. Um, and family related care. I think that uh, I'm just thinking of this because clearly even 10,000 is not enough to support um the livelihood to, this could be a full-time job if you really want to do it well or at least it consumes many many hours so even ten thousand doesn't feel enough and so i was thinking more in terms of like what are the blocks um, barriers to for people to join and so child care or is it high speed internet i mean child care seems like a clear like a no-brainer to me that would definitely be something that is obviously a barrier and I'm thinking of what are some other barriers that people may have, whether it's high speed internet, is it, um, you know, ability to provide food that day, I don't know what it is. So I wonder if it would be helpful to get a sense, of course, I'd love to hear from other counselors uh, with different, you know, different backgrounds to share what you think, but I think it might be helpful to also reach out into, and, and maybe you already did that, if you did reach out to the community to get a sense of, you know, what, what can a town do to remove the barriers for you to step into that role? So has that question or something like that been asked formally or informally? Are there any other comments or questions or reply to Shalini's questions? 
I'll just say that I think that's a really, really excellent suggestion, Shalini, and I would love to figure out a way that we can um, have that outreach and and ask those questions of more people in the community. So thank you for suggesting that. I really appreciate that. Michelle, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Michelle, you spoke. Alicia, did you want to respond to that? Um, Yeah, I just wanted to respond to Shalini really quickly. I also think that... uh, those are great questions. And I think that we're in a space where, um, like we, we definitely want that outreach to happen, but it's kind of difficult because there haven't been many, uh, parents or people who have children like of at an age that need to be cared for on the council. So to collect that data is kind of difficult. Um, but I can tell you what my experiences have been and that is what has sort of motivated me to work on um, to work on this memo and to work on this proposal is because it has been very challenging. And I think you even did mention a lot of the other things is that, you know, making sure that the kids are fed on this night. And if I do have a sitter, I'm ordering food so that I'm not requiring my sitter who is usually a high school family member to be cooking for my kids. And, you know, there are a lot of other things. And so again, I think Michelle and I think that this is the very basic first step and and we do hope that more can be done, but we're hoping that this can serve as a baseline. Thank you, Alicia. Pat. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, I'm not muted. Um, I I have no problem at all with the idea of, uh, family care or child care being provided, I think that is a no-brainer. I also uh, uh, think that for some families, for some council members, it might be very important um, to have food provided. Um, the place that I'm stuck in, um, in is we're deny we're limiting the amount of money that goes to each department. And we have teachers and paraprofessionals who are underpaid in Amherst. And I'll say that, you know, I'm, and I, as a teacher, I know about that as former teacher. So for me, I, I'm really trying to get my head around or heart around the idea that I'm gonna raise my salary. That's kind of where I'm stuck in, in a way that I'm not allowing um, people whose work is maybe even more important than mine um, to have. So I, I'm really stuck there. And if there's any way, um, not necessarily right now, but you can help me think through that, that would be helpful. Shalini? Oh, I had exactly the same um, thoughts that Pat was just sharing that I feel, yeah, there's so many people who are underpaid right now and for us to do, and that's why I was thinking more that instead of everyone, all the counselors getting 10,000, I wonder if it would make more sense to direct focus the funds towards meeting the needs uh, of, you know, of specific needs. So it it being need-based rather than across the board. So providing for food, because I know I've really not cooked enough because of council like i am either buying or you know whatever so but not from like i don't i'd rather that money went towards yeah towards food and of people who like need based sort of a thing and not in a way that it is because uh, as dorothy stated in the earlier discussion we had sometimes it's awkward for families to ask for especially i've heard that also in school that they will not ask for Uh, free leisure services, even though leisure services is free to every family, but sometimes families are hesitant to ask for free and they'd rather just not send their kids. So I understand that's a a barrier too, Um, but figuring out a way that, you know, where we can direct the funds in a more focused, intentional way where it really has an impact uh, rather than just increasing it across the board for everybody much as I would like to get 10,000. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to, uh, Dorothy, I'm going to go to Andy and come back to you since you've spoken already. Andy? You know, several people now have made the comments uh, in the way that I was. Um, 
I'm certainly going to vote uh, in favor of the motion on the floor because I think that it should be referred to committee. I think we should have a thorough discussion in the committee of the issues that have just been talked about and then uh, go from there back to the council so that all of us can have the discussion once again after it happens. So I think it uh, is valuable that it's been brought forward and that we're going to have the opportunity. There are some issues that I had outlined when I read it, and I think that they've been talked about. I think that the given what's happening with uh, you know concerns about uh, uh, the Amherst Professional uh, Public and Column Education Association and their unhappiness and are about to go out to ask voters to um, approve a debt exclusion that there's, you know, we need to be thinking about um, optics and everything that we do. And, I, and there are extraordinary pressures that are going to be in place as we adopt um, the budget for the year ahead, FY24, the state aid amounts are not uh, looking like they're going to come in favorably just based on um, how uh, the governor's proposal on um, municipal aid plays out. And I think that the other thing that I was um, concerned about is that um, it's actually more expensive for us because we're an extraordinarily large council. And as you compare these other communities, you know, most of them are, you know, five or so counselors. Uh, and, you know, we, um, our charter commission um, decided that we would be best off at the very large council, but it means that um, the salary question um, plays out to a much larger number of people. But those are questions that I think need to be explored outlined and then come back and be talked about again so um let's say you know let's make the referral and you know we'll do our best to get it back and frame the discussion just to clarify we actually already voted a referral to the finance committee i just wanted to clarify it included everything that was mentioned in the memo so we're not going to vote again on this uh, it's already been referred. Dorothy, any final comment before we move on? Yes. I think that we should not underestimate how difficult it's going to be to get a really representative and diverse council. Uh, we have to move quickly on this because there is a time frame. We are not voting on our own pay. We're voting on the pay for the next council. And if you don't feel that you can vote money that you get, then you don't run for that next council. So that gets rid of that problem. Uh, I don't agree with needs-based pay. I understand the reasoning behind it and, and, and it's very well-intentioned, but I think that for us, for people to be feeling equal as council members, the pay should be the same. If somebody privately wants to give theirs back, that's up to them, okay? But um, I don't think anyone should have to ask for it. Whatever the pay is, that's what it is, and you should just get it. So I think this is very important, and I'm glad it's come forward. And we do have to move because I think it has to be done within 18 months. Is that right, Lynn? That we have, so it has to be moved on. on it. So I, if anyone is worried about the councilor, town council members not working hard enough, I think that they should put that worry aside because everybody is and knows exactly how many hours it is. And we want to encourage more wonderful people to run for the council. Okay. Are there any further comments? This has already been referred, and we've actually asked that, if possible, there be a something come back to the council by April first. Okay. Seeing nothing, then I'm going to move on to. There's no appointments. Uh, are there any reports for? committee and liaison reports. And I'm going to start with, as soon as I find my notes, sorry. When we're in the town room, I have more room to spread out. Mandy Jo. Um, we continue to work on rental permitting and the referral on the proposal by myself and Pat on duplexes and more. Um, the hearing for the duplex and extra um, 
zoning proposal is this Thursday um, at 4.35 p.m. And I'm assuming that neither of those are ready to come back to the council, at least for the 6th of March. No, no, okay. we're looking at April at the earliest for at least the permitting and probably later for the other one. Okay, elementary school building committee, Kathy. The, um, there is a list of meetings that has been set up and um, I wanna make sure we can email it to everyone and we can put it, we're gonna talking about putting it up on the town website to present the project. We had the first of them on Sunday at Crocker Farm in the middle of a snowstorm. Um, so that one has happened already. But these meetings, people should really be thinking about them that they are district meetings, but especially any of them that are in person, other people can come to them. This is where people can come to get information. Uh, the other, the uh, report that's required by the MSBA called schematic design was submitted last week. So we are moving forward on all of this. And we're updating the website with frequently asked questions where we now had the question with an answer rather than just a long list of questions. And we hope to have that updated. Um, so I really encourage all of you to let everyone know, not just about your own district meetings, but if you can say, you know, if you can't come to ours, there's another one. Um, and Michelle and I on the very last one, the April 16th, which is the last in the series, that's a you all come to the mill district with an offer of food being pr provided in the afternoon. So we that is not going to be just a district one meeting. So I will get these out to everyone. And I talked to Brianna about posting them where we can have people understand that there are multiple opportunities. So people can come. We got great questions in our small turnout on Sunday. So I, that's not much else. The committee's not going to be very active because the next piece is May 2nd, the big next piece. Okay. okay, thank you. And by the way, that meeting was on Saturday during the snow. And right, right. so not Saturday. Right. right, so see, I don't even have my day right. Uh, <laughs> I also wanna just point out that anybody is welcome to go to any district meeting. Um, it, they're all posted on the calendars and uh, you can, if they're by Zoom, you're also welcome to join by Zoom. And I, I just, you know, Lynn, I was underscoring it because as far as I'm concerned, I'm doing a similar basic presentation. So if someone says, I can't make Wednesday right. night at seven o'clock, or I can't make this, just go say that, take a look at the schedule and maybe you can do another one. Yeah. Thank you. Finance Committee, Andy. I really don't have anything that I can add to the report that has already been provided to the committee. Certainly welcome suggestions and um, questions about it. Uh, we have the meeting tomorrow, and uh, I think that the uh, most challenging discussion that we're going to be having is regarding um, the funding plan for the elementary school building and which ties into then the question of the amount of debt that the council would need to authorize, which um, ties back to what we just approved in setting up the debt exclusion. Uh, so um, just wanted to remind you that that uh, discussion begins tomorrow and is going to be um, a very difficult one and a very um, detailed one. Um, but anyway, if there are other questions, ask them. If not, thank you. That meeting's at three o'clock. Correct. By Zoom. Okay. Jace, uh, G O L, Pat, you're unmuted. Thank you. I think the memo um, that I presented in our packet is self explanatory. We are asking uh, sponsors of proclamations, even if they're an, and resolutions, even if they're annual uh, months, to really review the material, to contact me, and, and because we and be have someone who is a sponsor be present at a GOL meeting, which are um, at nine thirty on um, Wednesday, every other Wednesday 
March 1st is the next one. It becomes critical. We spend an enormous amount of time trying to uh, make adjustments to um, resolutions and proclamations that the sponsors are really responsible for. Uh, and so we really need that help uh, and um, support. So we're looking ahead to the Jewish American Heritage Month proclamation, the uh, Child Abuse Awareness and Prevention Month and Arbor Month. I've been in contact with the sponsors of the Child Abuse Awareness and Prevention Month. Um, so I don't know. I think that's sort of enough. We're going to be continuing in detail a look at the rules of procedure. And obviously tonight, a couple of things came up that will be added to that list. And I, I think that's enough. Okay. Uh, JCPC, Kathy, I understand uh, you're chair again. I, I am. Um, I'm not going to give much more than say we're meeting every week. And the agenda tells you which departments are up. So you can look for this Thursday and we um, will get a report back to everyone. The big challenge, if you look at even the initial set of proposals we had from the town manager and staff is it's not quite balanced this year, um, the current coming year. And it looks a lot worse when you get out a couple of years in terms of our capital budget. So if anyone wanted to know whether the town has a money crunch, the answer is yes. Okay. Um, Jones Library, Anika. I would like to refer to Paul, please, for an update on the last meeting. Paul. Yeah, so they are um, just going through the basic design things right now. And they, they have eliminated a couple meetings, but sort of making progress on some of the um, uh, areas like about where we need surveying work done to connect with town uh, facilities and things like that. So relatively okay. short meetings actually lately. Okay. Uh, TSO, Anika. Okay, so our last meeting, uh, the uh, sewer and water regulations that we heard so much about were in discussion. Uh, we also continued discussion on the street lighting policy uh, with an update on the revised draft with discussion and continued on with the proposed waste hauler bylaw that we will continue in our next agenda for our meeting this Thursday at 7 p.m. Our requests have gone out for all um, counselors. If you have questions, do please submit them by the first. And uh, encourage, encourage anyone in the audience and, and spread the word um, so we can have as many from the public who are interested uh, attend. Thank you. Great. Are there any liaison reports? Michelle? Um, could I use this opportunity to give an update for AHRA? Absolutely. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so just to, uh, to update you all on the survey, um, we had planned a retreat last week to kick off the survey, but unfortunately we had to move it. Um, so it's happening this Wednesday evening from six to eight. Irv and I met uh, today with the Dunahue Institute, though, to kick off the survey officially. And um, to give you a timeline on that, we expect to finalize the questionnaire by uh, the end of this month, so 331. And then the survey will be open beginning April 4th. It will stay open until April 19th, unless we feel we need to keep it open longer. It is a very short window. Um, we have a very comprehensive list of uh, organizations and folks that this is going to go out to. Um, and then the Donahue expects to deliver um, the analysis to us by May 17th. So if anybody um, on the council here has any suggestions, I would love to hear them. Really appreciate everybody following along with this. Um, the other thing is um, I am asking you all to save the date. We are doing a screening of The Big Payback, which is um, a film that follows Evanston's journey uh, of reparations. Uh, Dr. Shabazz and I have a, a brief 
um, appearance in that. And we're doing that on March 30th at the Powerhouse on Amherst College campus. Um, we're doing this in partnership with the Amherst College Student Senate. And former Evanston Alderwoman Robin Rue Simmons will be joining us for the screening and also be um, uh, hosting a talk back session um, for folks who will be at the screening with us. So please save the date and I'll send that out also in an email. Great, thank you. Uh, and do you have a time for that one? Yes, it's going to begin at six o'clock. Great, thank you. Are there any, uh, yes, Pam, Rooney. All right, thank you. Um, planning board, but first um, a question for Michelle. Uh, are we going to be able to find the link to the survey? How are you going to push that out to us so that we can distribute? Absolutely, thank you. As soon as it's um, as soon as it's ready, I will send the link. Um, it's going to be on our Engage Amherst site. It's going to be on the Amherst our our, our um, town of Amherst webpage. Um, it's done through Qualtrics, so there will be a QR code. Um, and we will also be making physical copies that will be distributed throughout different locations in town um, so that folks who do not have access to the to the internet will be able to access it. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, my, mine was quick uh, planning board uh, update. Uh, the planning board had sort of an ad hoc work session. That was a very fun uh, conversation to participate in or listen to at least. Um, where they looked at uh, the opportunities of, you know, truly areas that could be focused on uh, for development consideration. And uh, similar to what I participated in probably a while ago, uh, sort of some zoning bylaws that looked at mixed use development, for instance, at Atkins Corner. This is the kind of idea where um, opportunity to create some hubs or some nodes of development are, are a nice way to sort of approach planning. So I was very pleased to see that, that event. Thank you. Are there any other liaison reports? Okay, then uh, we don't have any minutes tonight uh, to approve. Paul, town manager. Sure, uh, just a few things. So first, very busy on working on the budget. We're doing the budget hearings department by department in prep preparation for delivering a budget, a balanced budget to the council by May 1st. Um, there's a lot of construction going on in town. You may have noticed it, but there's a lot of building projects and um, permits being processed through the inspection services. So they're very busy down there reviewing pro uh, projects that are coming through the door. Um, a really good event yesterday and for Black History Month um, put on by the DEI department. Um, his Black History Through Music and Ben Harrington and uh, Pamela and Jennifer all made presentations. Uh, so a nice turnout there. Um, we're getting ready for the big night. If you don't know what the big night is, it's when the salamanders come out and sort of uh, do their dance once a year. And it happened. And so we're working with the public works department, the fire, the fire department and police department. This happens up on um, Henry Street where the Salamander Crossing is. Um, and so trying to make sure the Salamanders can get to where they wanna do their dancing um, and uh, whatever it is they do um, safely and that the people who are helping to guide them are safe as well. So working with the um, Hitchcock Center for that, and that's kind of a fun thing. So that happens and we don't know when that will happen. It will be, a some night in March when it's 40 degrees and it's rainy, and that's what brings them out. So everybody pays attention to it. It's called the big night. Uh, it's really kind of a neat thing. Another big night uh, we're preparing for this weekend's activities. Uh, this is the, um, the the event that will not be named. Um, so we will have, um, you will see police officers in town, press responders ready. Um, and you'll see a high, vis high, high visibility presence throughout the town on Saturday. Um, they start at 8 a.m. and are there most of the day. And this is to make sure um, mostly students who are, are partying are doing it safely and that the gatherings don't get too large or out of control. Um, the, 
And then also just a note that this is Sonia Aldridge's last week of work for the town. She ain't going away. She'll be back. She'll be back. Um, but um, so this is her her uh, swan song of being officially employed by the town full time. And while the snow has begun, so I'm anxious to go home. Um, we have uh, schools are closed tomorrow. We have delayed the opening of town hall until two o'clock, until ten o'clock. Uh, so we'll have a delayed opening of town hall tomorrow. And we have a parking ban. And there's a parking ban that starts at midnight tonight. Yes. Okay. Uh, under town, any questions for the town manager? Who would like to go home before he gets snowed in? <laughs> um, sounds good. Right. Uh, under the president's report, I, just a quick reminder, you were supposed to actually get it to me today, but I'll take it tomorrow. Uh, any issues or questions you want to make sure that we ask Senator Comerford and Representative Dom to speak to at their next at the next meeting. They will be essentially the first item starting at 645. So we'll be juggling a little bit to make sure that uh, we get other stuff done before they arrive, but they are not, uh, Senator Comerford is not available to them. Uh, I did not do a president's report, so I'll do a catch-up report for next week's meeting. Uh, and that's basically it, unless you have questions. Uh, under future agenda items, uh, Michelle and I are working on the uh, retreat, and we hope to have more information for you by next week. Um, and other questions or future agenda items counselors would like to raise. Please continue, by the way, to hold March 25th from 9 till about 2.30. Any other questions or comments from counselors? Mandy Jo. I just want to mention that uh, the MMA appointed its policy committees, and Paul is on one, Andy is on one, and I am on one. So... If you've got questions about state legislation that I, th I forget what Paul's is, but Andy's on finance. I'm on the municipal and regional administration, which is sort of a catch all for things like the bills we talked about tonight. Um, and Paul, what one are you on? Public works. Public works. So any state legislation, or anything like that, just talk to us about those things. And thanks to all three of you for that additional uh, state level leadership. Dorothy? Do we have a place for the retreat? Uh, it will have to be in the town room because it has to be broadcast because it's open to the public. So uh, we, we, we had it, we had one before and we did let the public in. Remember, I remember a couple of guys sitting in wherever they wanted, but that was it wasn't in the town. It, that was before we did uh, Zoom um, access. And um, Athena, do you have? Do you want to speak to this? Yes, thank you. Um, if counselors are participating remotely and we want to be accessible on Zoom, then the town room is the place to do it. I think it would be a different situation if everyone agreed to attend in person, and then we could do it like we had in the past, Dorothy. But um, in the situation that we're in right now with some counselors participating remotely, the town room is the best place. But if we're in, yeah. if we are all going to be in person, person and right. we don't take public comment, mm -hmm. can we set up in another place but still have Amherst Media televise the meeting? In the past, when we had, we're allowed to have fully in-person meetings. In the past, when we have had retreats at the Hitchcock Center and <clears throat> locations, we did not have Amherst Media come and set up, especially right. for us, and we okay. didn't have the meeting recorded. So that's uh, something that we can inquire about, but that's not how we had done it in the past. Dorothy, thank you for raising that. We will investigate and see what our other options are, okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Uh, Anna? Yeah, um, Mandy, could you share with the with the council what is a way that folks who might want to get involved in MMA committees in the future, how they should, and Andy too, 
how they could or should go about that. Um, I think it sounds really interesting and I'm, I'm not even sure where to start. <laughs> uh, so I started with every year around December, um, the MMA puts out a call for people interested in serving on policy committees. And there's a short application. It's basically who you are and sort of some of what your experience is and what committees you're actually interested in. Um, sometimes they have, they know what openings there might be if people are not trying to re-up or people are leaving and all. Um, but that's how I started. And then I think for me, Paul put me in touch with someone where there was an opening. Um, so, you know, I think keep your eyes and ears out to those, if those weekly MMA updates and particularly the beacon um, that talks about how to do it, but it's on the MMA website. Um, I don't know how Andy got involved, but I sort of had filled out an application and then Paul pointed me to a specific person who had, who was in charge of the committee I'm actually on. Thank you. That's helpful. Andy, did you want to speak to that? You know, there's not too much more to add to what Andy said. The application process is towards the end of the year and they make the decisions and then uh, the staff makes recommendations to the board and the board votes it. And uh, I think it's only been a couple of weeks ago that they made the announcement who would be on the 2023 committees. Um, you know, some of them are more competitive than others for, and they're more careful of the fiscal policy one maybe the most difficult one to get on because they're looking for people with a variety of experience in fiscal um, affairs and local level, but they're like three counselors from the entire state, three mayors from the entire state, three select board members from the entire state. So it's a, uh, you know, it's not that large a group so that they have to make some hard choices. Um, Paul? Yeah, just um, <clears throat> the good news is that they are always looking for counselors to serve. Usually there's a, a surplus of select board members and managers who want to serve, but the counselors, there are fewer people who are willing to be at a statewide body. So if you have an interest, look at the policy committees. If you have an interest, I can let them know that you're interested. They sometimes have a vacancy that comes up during the course of the year. Um, and I'm always love to advocate for our, our, our folks to be on committees. I think Amy serves as a technical advisor to one of the committees as well. So um, so we're always trying to get people on them. So if you're interested, please let me know. Okay. Mandy Joe, did you wanna comment further on that? Yeah, I forgot a couple of things. I actually think there's an opening for a counselor on one of the ones that the three of us aren't on when I was looking at the list. They just posted the full list of all of them I got an email about it, I think it was in the weekly notice of updates, um, and there was a link to see who all was pointed. And if there aren't three people under the list for counselors, there's an opening. Um, but the other good way to get involved, if you're interested, is through the MMCA um, Association, which is our Mass Municipal Counselors Association. And every year, um, sometime in July, they start asking for, if you're interested in being on the board of that or on the board of WEMO, which is the women's elected um, municipal officers. Um, and, and there's a couple other sort of sub sub boards um, that are also good ways to get involved in the MMA. Um, and those, those applications and stuff tend to come up in time for the January um, MMA conference because that's where the elections happen. So they, they start getting applications in the summer for that. Okay. And I'm going to just suggest that if any of us see notices, we just share them across the rest of the council. Okay. Um, Pat, you have your hand yeah. up. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going back to the retreat. Uh, in the original two retreats of the original council, there were people who came and sat in and watched. Uh, they did not participate. And there was no public comment period. When right. we said, and I do not wish to have on a time that I set aside to work on issues with the council to have to sit uh, uh, for public comment. I think that's inappropriate. 
Um, I, I don't mind the public there, there, although it does, you know, make it, you know, you know. There's two things that uh, retreats basically follow. And one is it's a special meeting of the town council. Therefore, we do not have public comment. And the other is that we don't take any votes. We yes. Talk yeah. about issues, right. but we don't take But you any did votes. say there was going to be public comment. So I just no, want to make sure I, there is. I, if I did, I misspoke. There okay, will be great. no public comment. Thank you. Thank but it you. does have to be accessible to the public. Okay. I didn't hear that last thing, but it has awesome. to be accessible to the public. Yes, absolutely. In other words, absolutely. it has to be an open meeting. Yeah, but yeah. no public comment. But no public comment. Yeah, I'm sorry, I misled you on that. Are there any other comments or questions from the council? Seeing none, then it's the meeting is adjourned at ten eighteen. Thank you. <laughs>